<laughs> so we're really moving, we have moved towards a new paradigm. This is the old paradigm of research in, in rare diseases, that as you go out and you get fundraising or you get an NIH grant and you request or you request research proposals, you select an applicant, applicant executes a study and then repeat the cycle. Um, but when numbers of, are interested in qualified researchers in areas is limited to just a few, as in a rare disease, it is unlikely that applications will propose, applicants will propose the, mo the important studies and be submitted by the most important qualified researchers. Each, um, sorry, thank you. Each study was often conceived of and developed independently from the others, preventing a coordinated disease-wise plan of emerging, from emerging and patient samples are inherently scarce. No single laboratories or researchers can do it alone. There has been sample sharing to achieve um, the numbers needed to reach meaningful insights. This is all from David Feigenbaum's um, book, Chasing the Cure. And so out of this came the Catastrophic Disease Modeling Network, um, or cord I'm sorry, Castleman's <laughs> Disease um, 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 Coordination Network, um, which is shown here, and we won't go into this in great detail, but um, it starts out with building a community. We have a community. Um, crowdsourcing research agenda, you know, trying to go to all sources to find out what really needs to be done. Um, find the researchers, fundraise and apply for grants, procure samples, execute the studies, um, analyze data, share knowledge, and then back to the top and around the circle. Um, we were lucky to get a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, grant to link patient groups to in investigative groups. And we've just been doing that this year and we've been going, going, going gung-ho in it. So this is the, also the philosophy of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and why should patients and investigators partner in research to find treatments for rare diseases? Well, it brings important insights and expertise to the work, builds public trust, helps diversify participation and engagement, improves relevant of, relevance of research to communities it aims to serve, and it is simply good science. Um, th these are a few quotes I lifted from Sharon Terry, Terry, who has been an icon in the field and advocate for getting patient groups involved. Um, she's currently president of the um, Genetic Alliance. Um, participants have a place throughout the research continuum, including the proposal and prioritization of research questions, study design, engagement of study participants, and their recruitment and retention, conduct of research and data analysis, and implementation and dissemination of results and often individuals own data. Engagement must be built on trust relationship rather than on transactions such as consent. Engagement, which is often reduced to recruitment and retention is essential. Every meeting on clinical research includes a discussion of the only three to 4% participation rate in clinical trials. This won't change unless resources are deployed. And so we're here to do this, okay? We're here to bring patients and investigators together, try to find ways to partner and to um, accelerate and move forward the research for Catacil. And so here's our agenda. We're a little bit behind schedule, unfortunately, but we'll pick up time. And um, so we have the first two talks are from our CZAI grant groups. First one is going to be Jane Gunther representing the patient side of it. And then we have Stephen Fitzsimons, who's representing the investigator side of it. Fanny Elahi had another speaking commitment today, so she couldn't make this. Um, then we're gonna have Jane Paulson give an update on where they're at with their NIH study um, called the Catacil Consortium Study. Manfred Berm, who was very gracious to come from the NIH, talk about the study he's had ongoing actually for a number of years. And then Josa Arbolita Velasquez, who is from Harvard and has been studying also for a number of years, will, will um, give us an update. We'll try to go quickly through these slides so that we have time for discussion at the end of the day. We'll take a break and we'll move a couple chairs around and we'll sit up front and at the end we'll take um, questions from the audience. We have some pre-meeting questions that we've gathered from patients and that's where we'll go. So. 
Shane Gunther um, graduated with a BS degree from Marquette University, and notably, this past year was named Alumna of the Year in Health Sciences by Mar Marquette University. She received her PhD from the University of Utah and subsequently has had a number of key scientific positions at major pharmaceutical companies. Currently, she's um, Director of Discovery Biotherapeutics. Did I have that right? <laughs> at Exolysis. And Jane has served President of Cure Catacil from 2020 to 2022, three years. Under her leadership and with co-PI Fanny Elahi at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, Cure Catacil was awarded this prestigious um, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative grant. This grant uniquely brings together investigators and with a patient-led organization in the patient partner collaborations for rare neurodegenerative disease program. And so I'll turn it over to early because I was like, I have to figure out these tools. <laughs> yeah. This is what you talk in here. This is the one that advances. All right, seriously. That's intuitively the, the, the I know the one that says backwards is the one that goes forward. All right. Uh, thank you, Bert, for that excellent introduction to the Please rare. The oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that, in, that excellent introduction to the rare disease landscape because it, it, I do work in drug development and the rare disease space is different than the other major diseases in that the patient community is really key to driving to therapeutics. So it's, uh, we really need people to come out of their homes and, and participate. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of idea of, of what that participation can look like with my, with my slides. Um, but I, I will say it's been a great learning experience for Cure Catacil's board. Uh, myself, Bert, Pedro. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro and uh, Sandra Talbert and Debbie Robinson. Uh, it's really a small group. It's amazing what a small group of people can do. So I encourage that small group of the Catacil community to really um, come together to really move towards therapeutics because we are in an incredibly different space. And, and, and Joe, maybe you can can align with that with me. Is that we we're in an incredibly different space than where it was when I first started volunteering seven or eight years ago. And by the way, I was just an average person. If it sounded like I was something more than average <laughs> by the introduction, I'm just. I, you know, I have the same uh, skills as, as anyone else. Mine just happened to be a passion for science and for discovery and for curing diseases. So that's what I do for work, and that's what I'm hoping to do with Catacil, for Catacil. Um, I'm going to try to advance my slide. All right, so just giving you an idea of what the landscape is for Catacil and our, and the role of Cure Catacil in that. Our mission, we call it CARE. We have a CARE mission. It is, we wanted it to improve communication, we do advocacy, re, we support research, and we're trying now to lead research. As, as Bert pointed out, that's, that's the, the paradigm in rare disease, that the patient organization needs to be a partner in helping to lead that research and accelerate it towards a cure. And we also want to get, get out there and, and provide education to the community. So our research strategy, as you might have seen from Bert's slides, is, it's, it's led, is, is to lead patient-partnered research. And I'm saying lead because we're, you can't all do it. We, someone has to step up and lead. So thank you <laughs> for the Kira Catacil volunteers for being part of that leading. And thank you so much to the community for supporting us with your donations and other people that have volunteered many hours. Um, we are focused on understanding the current landscape of Catacil research, and we're identifying key gaps in knowledge so we can fill these gaps and establish pathways to potential therapeutics. And really, as I've mentioned, is, you know, these partnerships are really going to help with the researchers, with pharma, with the, the patient community. It's really going to accelerate leading to uh, therapeutics. I have to remember I'm the person that... <laughs> that changes the slides. All right, I'm going to uh, walk through this figure. Um, hopefully, uh, you can see the circle there around the center cube, which the center cube is, I titled it Our Patient Partnered Research because I said, Cure Catacil is leading, but it really, it's our, it's our role. You know, we're, we're partnering up to, to lead, uh, you know, to 
partner with the, le the researchers. So at the very top, you see that we have Catacil Connection webinar series that I mentioned earlier while we were having the AV trouble. <laughs> and that's, so this, that's the space where we kind of started from. I'm, well, I, I apologize. Barbara, who is the founder, <laughs> one of the co-founders of Cure Catacil. I'm starting off where, where, where my history starts. So, um, so here we have my history starts with you know, forming the Catacil Connection and webinar series. And this actually is the first time that anyone has put out there uh, live uh, webinars on the research in Catacil, and we have the recordings on our website. And what's really awesome is that we have the international community of Catacil researchers and patients also call in or listen to our recordings. So it really is a, a great resource. And when pharma comes knocking, that's where I direct them when they want to learn more about Catacil. Um, the other thing that the organization has started is a Catacil family registry. We have over 400 um, patients and enrolled, and thank you so much for, to people for that. I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that. And then we have a fundraiser. It's the Million Dollar Bike Ride. You might have heard of it because we just had it. Uh, Pedro was leading that effort. Thank you, Pedro. Did you have any numbers for me as to how much money we've raised over the last years in our, in our rides? Yeah, so I think it's uh, between 400 and 500,000. So, so, so he, and for those who are on the on Zoom, he said between four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. Wow, that is awesome! <laughs> so, and that is to you know, that's you know, this is the community that's supporting that. So, the, the important thing about the million dollar bike ride grant, and this is um, organized through the University of Pennsylvania Orphan Disease Center. They've made it possible for small groups like us to raise that amount of money. If those checks had to come in to cure Catacil. I don't think us five board members would be able to have the time of day to do that and to do the work that we do for the organization. So the UPenn allows us to raise those funds. So it, each year it's about 80 to eighty to $100,000 grant. And there, we consider those seed grants. It can be difficult for young researchers to get funding in Catacil. Uh, Joe knows that. <laughs> and, and so to be able to have that small grant in order to get the data that they can then use to apply for a larger grant. It's hard to apply for a large grant without, without any proof of concept. So we give that funding that allows some proof of concept. And then you can hear about the research and on our, in our webinar series. So we ask our, our recipients of the grant to, to um, do a webinar. So you can see what happened with that money. Um, so one of the, the great things that came on the scene was Dr. Bohm's natural history study, because I believe it's the first in Catacil, and it's been going on for uh, four years, probably. No, it's eight. eight years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, time flies. <laughs> uh, and so it's very important to have these natural history studies. This is really gathering the knowledge about the disease progression and to really start giving insights on pathways that we could be targeted for therapy. And, uh, and, and we have, there's three natural patient history studies that you can see up here, and I'll go I'll touch on the other two shortly. But one of the other things that has been, in the last couple of years, I co-founded and I co-lead, along with Bert and Dr. Chris Hopkins, um, the Catacil Disease Modeling Group, and several of the members, several of the researchers here in the room participate in that. Over there, too. <laughs> and this is the first time that the U.S. Catacil researchers are meeting together. And as I said on the earlier slide, what are the gaps in knowledge? That was the first thing that they wanted to do. They said, okay, what's the gaps in knowledge? Now, what can we do to go after that and to fill those gaps in knowledge? And out of that became a collaboration with Dr. Fanny Alahi and other members of the, the uh, Catacil Disease Modeling Group. It, uh, she already had her, her, her patient study ongoing called Fast Brain, but with the partnership with the other researchers, she's put together a grant that was to look at the basic science. She was already working on that too, but she married that together, her, her uh, patient history study, along with her basic research, and applied for the Chan Zuckerberg grant. This is, I can't even tell you how awesome this is. We, there was, 10 uh, recipients of the grant out of almost 300 applicants worldwide. And so that's really an honor. And it was a, a million dollar grant of which Fanny receives 800,000 and Cure Catacils receives 200,000 over the next two years to um, our role is to 
increase patient engagement and understanding of their role and the importance of that, that you are a partner in this research. Um, so the, another next cube up I'm going to go to is the Catacil Consortium study. This is the, the largest patient history study. You'll hear about, more about that today. And it's in currently enrolling, as well as with Fanny's study. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure if you're still enrolling. In your study. Oh, yep, all three studies enrolling. And the important thing is you can participate in all three studies. So it, there's an opportunity to really expand our knowledge. Each study has their unique focus. They have commonalities as well as you know, unique areas of focus. So hopefully you'll, you'll be able to listen for that today as they, as you're, as they present their research. And off on the side, I have the interested pharma. Every year we hear from, Cure Catacil hears from two to three pharmaceutical companies, tiny ones to big ones <laughs> that, are, that are interested in Catacil. Because it's a genetic disease with cerebral vascular disorder, it's, it can be a model for cerebral vascular diseases that are not genetic, that really does affect, affect a, a much larger population. So this could be an insight by, by understanding Catacil to understand a disease that affects much, many more people. And one of the things that pharma is looking for, at least that, that goes around in the rare disease community, what we hear is that you should have 1,000 people enrolled in your patient registry. Because pharma knows that if you have 1,000 people, they have enough people to do a, a, a decent clinical trial. But right now we have about 400 people, a little over 400 in our patient registry. But the, 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 the pharma is also looking at, well, what patient history do you have? It's very hard to tell if a drug has an effect on a disease if you don't understand, understand the disease progression. And so the patient history studies are very important in that, for that aspect. So pharma is looking, to, are the, is the community organized? Is the community out there and ready and wanting a, a therapy? And do we have the data to be, in order to ad adequately evaluate our drug? I speak, I speak that actually from being someone who does drug development. So three things to know about Catacil research, I think, just this is from my perspective, is that NOTCH3 is a signaling molecule. It's a protein that then touches on different pathways in the body. And because of that, our disease is a little more complex than if you were to just be missing a protein. There's, it's a little bit easier to develop a drug if you just need to replace a protein. But we have a, a protein that's been mutated that now has a different function. And maybe there's a loss of function or a gain in function, and it depends maybe on the pathway. So there may need to be several therapeutics to target these major pathways that cause the, cause the disease progression. You might hear the word biomarker today. Um, it, it, it's, the term can be used two ways. And one of the ways is to monitor to disease, the disease progression in the clinical trials to determine if the drug is having an effect. And I just want to give you a, a, an easy example of what a biomarker is. So when you go to the doctor and you have your blood drawn, they measure different things. And then one of the things is cholesterol. And that cholesterol is a marker for cardiovascular disease. It's a biomarker for cardiovascular disease. If it's increased, then your doctor will be like, oh, there is a risk that you have going to have cardiovascular disease or that you have ongoing cardiovascular disease. And they'll give you a drug, a statin. And then you're, you'll, they'll check again, and your cholesterol levels went down. And they said, yep, the drug worked. So that's how they're using the biomarker to identify the disease, and then to identify that the drug has been effective in monitoring your cholesterol, lowering your cholesterol, and reducing your risk for cardiovascular disease. And that's what we're, we need from your patient samples is to be able to look for those biomarkers that are unique to Catacil so that your disease can be monitored and the therapeutics can be assessed. And the last thing I, is I think is important to know, because I do work in drug development, we don't always know how our drugs work. So you can, there's drugs on the market that we don't know exactly how it's modifying the disease, but it is, it's working. Researchers will continue studying along the way to understand the disease more, but we don't need to know the disease completely in order to be able to have a therapeutic. So I you know, want to put that, that knowledge out there that, yes, it's a complicated disease, but it's, there's many complicated diseases that we do have um, effective drugs on the market. 
So what, what is out there for Catacil? Well, there's no approved drug that's disease-modifying for Catacil. There, are, there have been four rep drug repurposing trials, and maybe some of pe people are on Aricep uh, for their Catacil. Um, so there has been four drug repurposing, and I'm not going to be speaking about those today, but they are published, so you can read about them. Um, but the two, there's two ongoing trials, and neither are in the U.S., so the U.S., Citizens cannot be, cannot um, enroll in them, as far as I know. So the one that's furthest along is from a nutraceutical company that's located in Malaysia, but the trial is being held in France, and it's the the, the principal investigator on that is a, a catacil researcher, clinical researcher, who uh, has an expertise in catacil. The trial is two years in duration, and their estimated completion date is the end of this year. And the, 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 effic the title of the trial is Efficacy and Safety of Trochotrienols in Catacil. And trochotrienols are a, a form of vitamin E. And the other ongoing trial is one in Japan. <clears throat> that one was enrolling, I believe it was started enrolling last year. And it's with adrenomedulin. Adrenomedulin is an endogenous protein. So it means your body <clears throat> naturally uh, produces that protein, it needs that protein. It has different functions, and one of the functions that it has that the, the uh, principal investigators believe could be important in Catacil is that it promotes differentiation of myelinating cells into mature cells under hypo hypoxic conditions, which means that the myelinating cells are important for your neurons to be communicating appropriately, and um, so it's promoting that healthy environment. And in, in when it says it's in the hypoxic conditions, that would be under a condition where you don't have a lot of oxygen. So you don't have the, or, or have, the, the, have the healthy environment that the cells need, and which happens with catacil because the vasculature is affected by catacil. You have more of a hypoxic condition. And so it's thought that it, this would kind of reduce the effect of the cells being in that hypoxic condition. One of the um, therapeutics that we've, that's, I won't even call it therapeutic yet because it's, it's, not, it's not in patients at, as, at, at this point, but one of the other approaches that we're aware of is what's called the antisense oligonucleotide, and that's being worked out of the, of the Leiden University in the Netherlands. And um, we don't know where they're at with their research because the last we spoke with the, the PI, uh, Saskia Oberstein, was that she was, talking with, uh, she was working with a pharmaceutical company, so then, you know, then the things went dead <laughs> in terms of communication, because the pharma doesn't want to um, put out their, what, what, what they're doing until they really have something. But in this case, I wanted to describe a little bit what an antisense oligonucleotide is, because they often are used in genetic diseases. In this case, as you probably are familiar with, there's a mutation, a single mutation in the DNA, uh, in, in the, of the notch gene. And with the exon skipping antisense oligonucleotide allows is for that as you, as the, it, your DNA forms RNA and from the RNA, there's a reading of the RNA and your body produces a protein. So it's just like a, a message. It, uh, it's a template for making proteins, your RNA. It, the protein doesn't get made from the DNA because your body's smart and it doesn't, that's, you gotta keep the DNA safe, so it produces RNA, which is a copy of the DNA, and then the, D the RNA gets read to make the protein. So when you have the mutation, you get this mutated protein, but with an exon-skipping antisense oligonucleotide, you have a snippet of, the, of what matches the RNA, and it'll place itself on top of the mutated portion of the, of the gene, and is that, or not the gene, but of the RNA, and is that it gets read through to make that protein, skips over that mutation, and, and makes a functional intact protein. And that's what their, their non-clinical data, which they've published, has shown, is that the exon skipping worked without affecting the function, the function of the notch protein signaling. And I'm going to introduce then the two research, research areas that 
are ongoing. There's more, more other research going on in ter terms of driving towards therapeutics in Catasil. But today we're highlighting that with the role of the immune system dysfunction in Catasil, and I'll be our ne next speaker, and then we'll have Dr. Joe um, talk about his Agnes um, Notch 3 antibody to restore loss function. And with that, I'm going to ask all of you to think about how it is that you can be the difference. Uh, it may be that it would be in volunteering time, as, as the board members have. It may be that, thank you so much for all the donations people send our organization, because believe me, I am so thankful while I was president that, I, that people donate, and I didn't have to go out and fundraise. I could focus on that, that slide with the cubes. That was the work I was doing. And thank goodness, because I'm probably better at that, the science, than I am than I would be if I had to go out and fundraise. So I'm very thankful to the community to continue you know, supporting Cure Catasil and, and supporting the Million Dollar Bike Ride. So those are ways that you can participate. And you'll also hear today that it, you know, the importance of participating in the patient studies. So thank you. I think we'll, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll skip questions at this moment and, and maybe do all the questions at the end. Hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, it's an honor to be here today to speak with all of you. Um, Dr. Alahi, unfortunately, this conference is really near and dear to her heart, but unfortunately, she had a conflict. Um, so you're stuck with me. Um, I've been working on Catasil for one year, so it's fantastic for me to come here to learn from patients, to learn from families, and to learn from academics uh, who are leading experts in the field and also clinicians. I'm also here on behalf of the Alahi Lab. They're at the back here, and I'd, I'd really encourage you to reach out. We brought all six members, um, so it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to get to know them and them to get to know you. So uh, just first of all, uh, oops, the other way. So just, uh, I've no disclosures, no conflicts of interest. Um, so we're working at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Uh, Dr. Lahi was working in UCSF previously. Uh, we're one year young, let's say. Uh, we work here on the 20th floor of the Annenberg building with uh, lovely views. Um, so uh, we'd encourage, you know, uh, research participants, you know, to, to join us if you do have the time and uh, to, to volunteer for some of our studies. So just a bit about the talk outline. Uh, I want to talk a bit about patient, patient participation in research. Uh, that would be from, from a scientific uh, art perspective. I know Jane has covered a lot of that already. Uh, our latest so these are un unpublished findings that we'd like to share and some of our future work planned with the CZI grant and finally our ongoing study which is called uh, VASC Brain. I'd like to tell you a bit about, a bit about that. Um, so first of all, uh, we feel that teamwork and collaboration are essential to drive um, Catasil research to identify new therapeutics and uh, identify therapeutics with clinical meaningful results. So this is our team here. And uh, at the center of our network, uh, we feel that another team member is our research participants. Uh, and they uh, play a central role in our research. Uh, all members here on a day-to-day -day basis, they either interact with patients, uh, they interact with blood samples, uh, they interact with clinical data. Uh, so we really feel that our research participants, we want them to be part of our team, part of our collaboration. We're very fortunate to have a, a great network of collaborators as well uh, and to be partnered with Cure Catasil. So we've research participants uh, enrolled uh, from all over the US. Uh, we have uh, 58 uh, sorry, I'll just get the correct numbers, 58 remote, and we have 73 in person, so this is in the US, and then globally you can see we have some in Europe and Asia. Um, so first of all, I just want to uh, say from a scientific perspective, we want to know how can we go from an idea to uh, therapeutics. There's multiple stakeholders involved, there's the scientists, caregivers, funders, families, clinicians, patients, but really, we feel that uh, research participants are essential to our work 
because with pharma industry, they want to know, they always ask for more data. They always ask um, for human data, from my experience, uh, dealing with uh, pharmaceutical companies. And that comes from participant uh, engagement. Uh, the more participants we have, the stronger our studies and the more robust and believable our findings are so that we can come and we can engage with pharma. Um, so your participant in research, it, it motivates us on a day-to-day -day basis. It helps to identify new therapeutic targets. Without participation in research, we would be dealing with just our cells, our animal models. So moving into to, to humans is really, really valuable for us. Um, as uh, Jane mentioned, uh, participation and the patient registry, that attracts pharmaceutical development and ultimately will help patients in the future. So just an overview of our research, what we're doing. We're currently in the discovery phase of our research. We're working on um, plasma, which is the more liquid part of blood, and we're also working on immune cells. And these would be representative of early stage disease. Um, as scientists, we want to be held accountable, so we have a progress tracker, um, and this phase is 75% is complete. So we want to keep our funders, we want to keep participants informed about how our research is going. Uh, another part of our discovery phase is analysing brain tissue, which has been very, very generously donated by our patients, and that has been a, an invaluable resource uh, towards our work. It's been integral towards our work. So we really th we're really grateful for that. And um, from that, we can also analyze uh, blood vessels. And this is more representative of, of end-stage disease. What we hope to do then, and this is actually ongoing work in the lab, from the blood, we can make stem cells. And we can make two-dimensional and three-dimensional models because we need these models to make sure the targets that we are looking at uh, are real. We want to validate our lead targets and set up these ultimately for drug testing in catacyl cells in a dish. So we want to screen approved, uh, FDA approved, and also new uh, therapeutic compounds to see if they could be effective for catacyl using patient-derived cells. Um, so just regarding the discovery phase, how can we identify therapeutic targets for catacyl? So as you know, catacyl uh, can, symptomology can come with age. And um, a lot of the catacyl research in, in papers will often focus on end stage of disease because they're looking at brain tissue. So what we want to do is we want to study the disease in multiple age groups. Um, Patients experience different symptoms at different ages, and as scientists, we want to know what is happening in the body during every age and stage of disease. We want to know, is there a therapeutic that would be most effective at a certain disease stage? So with the help of research participants, we aim to assess changes in catacyl over time. Uh, so what can we measure to discover new therapeutic targets? As I mentioned, end stage of catacyl, we can look at brain tissue, we can look at the blood vessels from the brain tissue as well. And um, regarding early and ongoing stages, we can look at plasma, we can look at the immune cells, we can perform brain imaging, retinal imaging, cognitive testing, and as I mentioned, our stem cells as well. There's something I left out here as well, is that we can also learn from patients and from participants. And Jane recently told me a story about a, a patient who had a cut and had a remarkably fast wound healing. And little stories like that get us thinking as scientists that maybe we can model this and maybe we can investigate this further. Um, so really, we want to listen to you guys as well and for you to share your stories. Um, so why analyze plasma from blood? It contains clues to what's going on in the body. It uh, can be used to identify dysregulation in the body. Furthermore, it's, very, it's in close proximity to the blood vessel walls, and we know they're to be affected in catacyl. It can also be used as a biomarker, which Jane has covered in detail, so we can monitor disease development, but crucially, we can monitor if a therapy is working if we have a good biomarker. So 
some of our findings, we measured over 7,000 proteins in the blood of 53 participants, and these participants were in the early stages of CADASIL. So the participants with CADASIL had 439 increased protein uh, and 98 de uh, decreased proteins. And interestingly, many of these proteins were coming from smooth muscle cells. Smooth muscle cells are the ones that support the vascular, uh, the vasculature or the vessel walls. So we took uh, our blood proteins, uh, ones changed in CADASIL, and we also looked at uh, blood vessel vasculature, and that contains uh, also proteins that are changed in CADASIL. And we found two major pathways in common. One was wound healing activation, and the second one was immune cell activation. So just a bit of a quick overview on what I mean by pathways and, and how, how we perceive uh, pathways and how proteins are involved in these pathways. So proteins function together like a series of cogs to maintain normal, healthy function. And when these proteins are functioning in, in, in harmony and the pathway is, is functioning normally, the body is generally in a state of balance and, and good health. What can happen is dysfunction of one or more of these proteins, as Jane mentioned earlier, you'd be familiar with NOTCH3, it can cause an imbalance in the pathway leading to uh, disease and, and damage. And so what we want to do is we want to understand the, the proteins that are, are going, uh, going awry and how they affect the pathway, because we could identify therapeutic targets among these. So our analysis of blood proteins, as I mentioned, we see uh, immune cell activation and we see wound healing activation. The one that I didn't share with you at all was dysregulated growth of new blood vessels. So that was our most, most interesting finding that we found. Um, and we hope to be able to validate this in our stem cell uh, models. So why analyze immune cells from the blood? Well, they're key players in repair of injury and disease. When out of control or chronically activated, they can lead to detrimental effects and they could be a potential therapeutic target. Um, many current therapies target the immune system, for example, multiple sclerosis therapies. And so our team of postdocs is, is working on blood on a day-to-day -day basis. But we don't want to limit our discovery to just one cell type. These are the monocytes, and these are my favorite cell type, actually. We don't want to just look at one. We want to look at all immune cell types. So this is ongoing in our lab currently. We're looking at 37 different immune cell types at once from the blood of research participants. And what we found so far in our very, very small pilot study, we found reduced numbers of two types of immune cells. And with the help of other research participants coming to our study, we can hopefully bolster those numbers and, um, and validate our findings. So this is the Penrose Triangle, also known as the Impossible Triangle. And you can see here at each at each uh, corner, we have immune cell dysfunction, wound healing activation, and dysregulated growth of blood vessels. So this exists uh, in, 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 in 2D, but it's very hard to uh, model in, in 3D. And I'm kind of showing this because it, it speaks to sometimes the challenge we have as researchers. We want to know what stage is coming first out of these three pathways, what stage is driving the symptoms, and what therapeutics could work. So in our stem cell models, we can uh, model each of these pathways individually, and we're also trying to model it in a three-dimensional space as well, which I will uh, move on to. So our ongoing and future work, as I mentioned, we, we have these changes in blood proteins, but are they really directly responsible for dysfunction? We need to identify the best therapeutic target. So we're gonna use stem cells derived from blood of patients. We change these cells into uh, cells of the brain and blood vessels, and we develop human 3D brains in a dish, which are reflective of catasol. So here in red, I know it's a bit small, but these are actually our, our blood vessels. And this is in collaboration with the Blanchard lab. So, uh, Furthermore, this is, might look like a kind of a donut, but it's actually a, a mini brain. And here in red are the blood vessels. We can also image the brain cells in those as well, which are seen here in green. So this is like an overlapping image. You can see here a lovely kind of 3D 
uh, model. And the reason, the reason that this is very valuable is that we can look at dysfunction in this model and we can also test our therapeutic targets. Once again, this was done by Louise Lorio in the Blanchard lab. So that's been done in, in, um, in, in cells without the notch 3 mutation. Our next step is to use cells with the notch 3 mutation to try and mimic this. That's uh, a really, pardon? Oh, apologies. Um, so do the mini brains um, that I just shown, do they have a uh, flow or are they just tubes with, with basically a collapsed uh, center? Uh, to answer your question, we haven't checked that in our mini brains, but we are developing also a kind of a chip based model. And unfortunately at the moment, there is no flow through them. We are trying to get small particles to flow through the lumen. However, uh, they're not working at the moment. So we're trying to make better endothelial cells to open up that lumen and hopefully have flow through. That would be the ultimate goal. So I think Jane uh, covered most of this, uh, but we were fortunate to receive a Chan Zuckerberg uh, Initiative Award uh, with partnership with Cure Cadisil. Uh, you can learn more about this on the Cure Cadisil uh, website. Um, the name of the study that we have is VASC Brain. So this is ongoing at Mount Sinai. Um, it's a study to identify the new target targets and pathways to develop therapeutics for Cadisil. Uh, so it would be building on the work I just showed you. We need more research participants. So the aims would be to understand the molecular and cellular changes to identify pathological immunovascular interactions and to build models such as the one I showed you for drug screening. So the VASC brain study, what does participation involve? It would involve a, a blood donation. It involves a questionnaire. We take some demographic data. Uh, it also involves a cognitive assessment. Uh, we have two clinical research coordinators, Ruth and Ryan, working on this. You can contact Ruth if you want more details. And this QR code would bring you to uh, our, our VASC brain website with details on the study. Um, we are also looking for um, participants who do not have Cadisil as well, because they are a very important comparative group. Um, you may be unable to travel to New York um, if you don't have uh, loved ones or you don't have business trips there um, and still want to be involved, you can sign up for remote assessments. Um, so I'd just like to finish with uh, why we should be hopeful. Um, well, we're working and have developed some novel targets and pathways identified in the blood and brain. These would have biomarker potential. I haven't addressed that today at all, but we do have some uh, biomarkers that could be uh, validated in other cohorts. Uh, we also have targets with therapeutic potential. We're developing our 3D stem cell models, and we are also setting up screens for new and existing drugs. So I'd just like to acknowledge, first of all, our research participants and study partners. Uh, those who have participated in our study, your, your participation has been invaluable and integral to our research, as I hope I've outlined. I'd like to thank the members of the Alahi Lab as well for your continued work and also attending here. And I'd like to thank Dr. Alahi as well, our collaborators. We are extremely grateful, Dr. Joe, Kira Cadisil, um, in addition to our funders as well. Um, I really would be happy to chat with anyone after, and our group at the back would be happy to chat. If you have any uh, questions, concerns, Dr. Alahi will also uh, be available as well via, via email, so feel free to contact her as well. Um, but I'd just like to thank you for listening to me today, and, and thank you for your time. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending today. It's really important. I agree with everything that Dr. Fitzsimmons and Dr. Gunter has shared. This is a partnership, and I'm happy to get to meet the partners here today, and we need to expand this group, and I just want to thank you for being here. 
Um, I don't need to go over this. There's one part of this I do want to emphasize, however. We are at the leukodystrophy meeting, which has been fabulous because we're sharing all these thoughts and ideas with other people who are very interested in the white matter. However, and you know uh, the definitions and why each part of this is part of the name that's been chosen for this disease, for Catacil. However, the part that really isn't talked about at this conference is the last part. Do we have a pointer? No. Or... Oh, that's a pointer and a slide mover? Okay. That's okay. The final one on here is the, the fact that we are a leukoencephalopathy, not a leukodystrophy. And the reason I want to point that out is all the rest of this, I think, and feel free to ask questions. It's a whole other talk. I would love to talk about how the subcortical infarcts are so different than the more traditional stroke and cortical infarcts that you witness in many other diseases. But that's another talk. So today, I need to focus on what the encephalopathy is. And what that means is the brain functions. So the focus of this disease isn't a developmental disorder. It's an acquired adult onset disorder. And what happens is the functions that you can do in your day-to-day -day life are interrupted by this small vessel disease. So to, to examine Catacil without paying very close attention to how that person feels or functions is, 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 isn't what we want to do. And that's why we need to be partners, because we really need your input uh, about what the important feelings and functions are. And that's going to be essential for us to develop the best treatments. These are our study sites. We are fortunate to have been awarded uh, an award. This isn't easy. We went in four times. I went in four times, <laughs> actually. Michael Gushman was the last time, but the first couple times I went in, Dr. Arbolita went with me. He was my first co-PI. Um, and appropriately, he said, wow, I'm working on my basic science, and this is a lot of work, so I really need to have my time for basic science. And so I'm like, yes. So we want to continue to collect data that's going to be essential for the basic scientists to look at, whether they're looking at proteomics or animal modeling or designing immune therapies or deriving stem cells. This study is to get the most people involved possible because as you'll see later in my talk, it is, in a, it, it is a mandated essential component of going towards treatments for rare diseases. So we tried to be geographically sensitive. We tried to choose sites all across the United States. Um, in this study, we will fly you anywhere you want to go. We pay for all costs, for the hotel, for all meals, plus we provide a stipend to you. We need you to come and participate in the research. This is the way the data flows, very confusing, but just start with each study site. Wherever you go, that data will go, and we send all data in an encrypted form, and then we protect your privacy above all things. So you can share with us how willing you are to step out of that privacy, confidentiality circle, and the ways to do it might be more for recruitment, retention, advocacy, but for the research itself, you do not have to. Uh, reveal anything to anybody. So all of the data is shared in an encrypted manner. The blood samples go over to the national repository. So that is the NIH repository that collects blood for all of the other neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so on. And that's called the NICRAD repository. And it is in Indiana. They also have a repository where my other research in Huntington's disease goes. And that's also at Indiana University. And that's for uh, younger onset uh, diseases that do not involve stroke in this case, or do not uh, overlap with Alzheimer's and related dementias. So all of that gets stored. And the reason we store it in a very safe place that's used to doing it, they have so many samples more than anyone in the world, is because they have the backup generators. They know how to do this. They can keep your data very safe. And we allow these samples to be used by anyone who has the credentials. 
So if Dr. Fitzsimmons, Dr. Arbolita Velasquez wants to come and say, wow, I have this great idea, or some, you know, Dr. You know, whatever, Smith from Bulgaria wants to study something, we're like, we're going to help you. Because anything that's going to advance our knowledge of Catacil, we want to help you. So all of the data we're collecting, we're going to share with anyone who will advance this disease. This isn't a, a centered project for one person, one institution, one anything. This is for everybody. This is an all, everyone benefits. So that's why it's stored there. Um, they also are going to share the money with Regeneron, who does a fabulous uh, uh, job of doing all exome sequencing, uh, genome-wide sequencing. So we will have every genetic sequencing on everyone that participates. One of the primary dilemmas right now, you can't run a treatment trial in Catacil right now, or if you do, it's, it's somewhat limited because there has been a publication that says mutations in exons 1 to 6 are much worse than those in 7 to 34. They are waiting for studies like this one to replicate that and extend it. What if there are indeed these subtypes of Catacil, which would not be surprising, there are subtypes of nearly every disease we have found. There are subtypes in Alzheimer's, Lewy body, Parkinson's, Huntington's. All of these diseases have subtypes. So then it isn't a one size fits all, is it? It isn't, here's your pill, call me in the morning. No, it's what subtype are you? Because I want to give the right treatment to the right person and at the right time. You might get a different treatment when you're 18 and you just got tested and now you're gonna get this treatment, but maybe when you get closer and you've had a few TIAs and maybe even one small stroke, you say, okay, now I'm ready for the next treatment. That's the future we wanna envision, where we can give the right treatment at the right time to the right person. So we are gonna get all of the genetics. Up on top are all the biomarkers. We're starting with identified biomarkers that we can analyze immediately and say, are they useful today? because all of the biomarkers we're gonna analyze are biomarkers that someone has already said, this is useful, and it m is useful in other diseases, so it might be useful in Catacil. If we can identify that right away, we already know how to mark the disease, follow the disease based on these biomarkers. Meanwhile, we absolutely need to continue Dr. Fitzsimmons, Dr. Arbolita's science that's going to get a better biomarker that's going to be catacil specific. But all of the biomarkers we're looking at have already been demonstrated as useful for some neurodegenerative disease. All of the neurodegenerative diseases, which catacil is one, mean you slowly lose that capacity over time. So exciting if we can go ahead and get a marker while we get better markers. That's the idea. Meanwhile, all of those samples are stored for future research, right? So we're really trying to build a resource for now and for the future and forever. Okay, let's look at the other side of the slide. That's where your blood goes. On the other side of the slide is your brain scan and all the other data. The data that says what symptoms are you having? How are you feeling? How are you functioning? What's most problematic to you? What do you care about? That goes over here to our database, which is a large integrated database that's in Georgia, it's in Atlanta. And they also have a large encrypted database where, of course, we will also save that, make it de-identified, which means they can't tell who you are. And we're super careful about that. Like, we can't even give your date of birth. We've got to jitter it because, you know, what if somebody, you know, can figure out who you are? So we're, it's very carefully driven. The scans also go to this very large imaging center, which is also in Atlanta, and we have no fewer than eight outcomes from your imaging that are analyzed. Two of them required new grants, so not only did we get the parent grant, which gives us, if we can do it successfully, it will give us over $21 million. Yeah, but that's only if we can do it successfully. Right now we're getting three million a year, but if we can't do it successfully, they take it back, I will be honest. So what we did is we already had these funded in our parent grant. We have since written four more grants. Two of them were already funded. This is the reactivity and this is a blood flow grant. So we're specifically looking at Catacil imaging parameters because we think these are better parameters to look at 
to analyze, okay, how is that picture of the brain going to help us with treatment trials? Are they going to be able to tell us when we should intervene with which treatment? Are they going to be able to track disease over time? When should you get what treatment and how do we know if it's working? So we are really focusing on doing the best job we can with our, our imaging analysis. We also have all the phenotype data, which is what I really need your help with. I've done this before. I've done it in other rare diseases for three decades. Yes, I'm very old, and I'm not going to tell you how old. But <laughs> in our other disease, we started just like this, just like this in a little bitty room with a few speckled of scientists, and we exploded. We now have 50,000 volunteers around the world. Yes, and they all donate blood, and they all step up to do lumbar punctures, and they're the people going into gene therapy, clinical trials, whether it's brain surgery or whether it's through your spinal cord, or maybe it's just an infusion therapy. But you got to start somewhere, and that's what Cure Catacel is doing for us. I'm so impressed with this, this foundation. So that's what we want to move towards, but we have to start. So we're also having clinical ratings that are going to say, this is how bad I think that is, and this is where it's going. So then at the end of the day, all of that data is available really to anyone. We have a big statistics team. We have five statisticians waiting to analyze your data, and then that will be disseminated out wherever we need it to go. It can go to CPATH, which is the pre-FDA group that's helping everybody get ready for that new treatment. So when these guys come up with their new treatments, we are going to be ready to go because we're going to work with CPATH. We're going to work with the FDA to have all of our ducks in a row. OK, so for this study, uh, who can participate? Really, anyone that is an adult and being willing to do the basics of this study, which are really similar to the other research that we've uh, uh, described already and also what Dr. Baum will be describing again. He has a brilliant study going at the NIH as well. And we are all going to work together to make a difference for Catacil. So you have to be an adult. You have to be willing to have a brain scan, have the blood draws. I'm hoping to move towards lumbar punctures because a better biomarker might be found if we look at right next to the brain cells in the brain. It might not because this is a vascular uh, disease. It might be a better biomarker that's in the blood. But most neurodegenerative diseases have a biomarker that's from the CSF fluid that's right next to your brain and is much more sensitive. So we'll see. But in this one, you just have to give blood, have a brain scan, and then go through the, the measures. Now, you don't have to be tested, and you don't have to know the findings of your test. Just so you know, that's very personal, as you know, and we respect that. Anyone who has a family history of Catacil can be in this study, and they can stay in the study, and we are funding your genetic testing. So if you come forward and you say, I don't want to know my results, but I do want to participate in making things better for my family and the next generation of my family, we say, thank you. Welcome and come in. And if you want to know your findings, we'll pay for it, and it will not go in anybody's medical record. It won't even go to your doctor. It won't go anywhere. You'll be the only one that owns that information because we respect your privacy. However, it will go back to that little data center I told you about. It won't even go out to the sites. They aren't going to know your findings. But it respects people's ability to get tested, to know that information, or not know that information. But it goes to the data center so we can use it in our data findings. So in this study, we want 500 people. We want 100 of those, at least, to be gene non-carriers, but siblings or relatives, they have to come from a Catacil family, but not have the gene mutation for Catacil. Why? Because they're the best comparison we have. We don't want to have to get, you know, Joe Schmo from the street, because he grew up in a different neighborhood. He's got a different environmental stressors. He's got everything different, and his genetics are going to be operating differently because of where he lived. So we need those family members, whether they're positive or negative. Everyone participates. OK? So it doesn't matter if you've had catacil testing or, but, or not, or if you want to know or not, but we will invite you into the study. This is an example of a visit. We basically go through the informed consent, which is tell you everything about the study. We do the blood draw because we do want it fasting, which means the blood is more pure if it isn't interrupted by what you ate that morning. 
then we'll give you a snack break right away. Phew, don't have to worry about that. And then at that point, we'll go through the assessments, which is the part I want your help with. What are the most important things? Because as starting out as one of the first studies, it's, there's way too many important things. So we're going to collect a lot, and then I want to narrow it down to what you think is the most important. Because we can't ask about everything. You know, if somebody says, well, I have extra wax in my ear, and I really think it's catacill related, OK. So we can ask, but if it doesn't, if, if the rest of you don't have extra wax in your ear, maybe I'm going to take it back out, right? So I need your input. And by the way, that other rare disease that I worked on that now is going through so many clinical trials, we can't even catch up with them. Um, they gave me the, in, the ideas of the best clinical markers we have, things I never would have thought of that they came up with in the families and they said, well, what about this? You know, my husband used to be so punctual and he's not. Oh, so we added a timing study. Guess what? Timing was interrupted. I wouldn't have added a timing study. We did a little metronome tap thing like your piano teacher used to do. And it turns out that was in milliseconds we measured it and it was interrupted really early. You never know. So please. Then we do a neuro exam and a brain MRI and, and we send you home. These are the main things. There's no cost to you. We pay for everything. There's a stipend provi provided. The, these visits do vary. I have found a great deal. So we're working with every site to get their visit down so it truly only lasts this long. It should never last longer. So that is my on me, because it is lasting longer at some places. If you've already volunteered, you're like, there's no way it can be done that fast. So I'm going to cut things, and I'm working with the sites. I'm going to get my frequent flyer miles up, because I'm going to each site to figure out what we can do to make it faster. And uh, you guys probably have ideas. You can say, take that measure out. That was worthless. Um, so I'm working on shortening it. OK. But the main thing I keep hearing is, well, we really want to be in a study you know, that's going to cure the disease. I don't really want to be in an observational study. So I'm here to clarify for you that there's really no difference among some of these studies. Now, definitely what Dr. Arbolita is doing, you know, he doesn't need the participants per se because he's doing very basic science. But the rest of us are doing observational research. And why? Because we can't jump into a treatment if we don't know how to decide if it's working, right? So we have some work to do. And I'll show you what that work is going to look like in a minute. But I want to talk about what is an observational natural history study and why would we even need it. They all are to work towards a treatment and a cure. There isn't an observational study that doesn't work towards a treatment and a cure. We have numbers we want to give back to the basic scientists to inform basic and clinical care and then design new studies. This is something I keep hearing that I'm trying to answer the question to. Any other questions, do feel free to ask. We have a answer your question thing on our website. OK, so just step back now. How do you get a new treatment approved by the Food and Drug Administration so that we can make lives different for families with catacil. And you'll see across the top, I've listed just what we have in the other rare diseases. We have from small molecules that we might be able just to take a pill. That'd be cool. We have in infusions, which some of you, how many of you have had an infusion or know someone who's had an infusion? You sit in a comfy chair, and they just put it in your vein. And the infusion might take a few minutes, might take a couple hours. You know what? It's pretty common. We have that for a lot of things today. And, and infusion. Then there's an intrathecal infusion, which they go into the spinal cord. And the reason we have to do that is because any brain disease will fight you if you go in just through the blood or just orally because of the blood-brain barrier. It's that super smart part of our bodies that says, oh, no, you're not going to get anything to my brain, right? So that's the cool part of our body, but it makes treatment tricky. So there are treatments that go right in through the spinal cord. And then finally, we also do brain surgeries for treatments. And these are all going on right now. Now, a new treatment can cost from 800 million to 3 billion. And I've been giving this talk, like I said, for decades, and the number just keeps creeping up. No surprise. It also can take from 12 to 15 years. Thankfully, for these pioneers, like Dr. Joe, 
and Jane and others and Dr. Boehm, who's done this before you know, we knew to do it, some of that's shaved off because they've done some of our work for us. <laughs> but for newbies like me, I've got to catch up and get going, right? So we're ready to make a treatment. You can search 10,000 compounds, which are drugs. A compound is just a drug, a treatment, to find just one that might even work. Thank goodness Dr. Fitzsimmons and his team are looking at this because sometimes it's already made and it's sitting there on the shelf and they don't know what to do with it. So that would be way cool if they could find one that works. The other way, though, is that we find pathways, like you've also heard about. We tell them about the pathway, or Dr. Joe finds a pathway in his models, and we say, wow, here's the pathway. We've got to figure out how to interrupt this pathway. And then we build it, you know? And believe me, it works. You build it, we can come. We'll take that med. The popular thing that's happening in rare disease is gene therapy. Now, you've already heard it's tricky in Catacil because we have all those mutations all throughout the Catacil gene, the Notch 3 mutations. However, this stuff is advancing literally every day. When I look up how many are approved, how many are under review, how many are in works, this number has tripled since I've done this slide. There are already are gene therapies approved. There are 34 today in the final stages. So they go in, they give you a treatment in your, in your, of genetics, and there are 470 in clinical trials right now. So this is a pretty popular thing that we want to stay on top of because the skipping, was it, was it Dr. Gunter that talked about the skipping? That is so exciting because we have done ASOs. I'm on a safety monitoring board for an ASO right now, so we watch to make sure it's safe. That's my job, but so I do have a conflict. Oops, okay, there's my conflict. <laughs> okay, so anyway, this is just a different graphic I found that shows you we can start with all these ideas for medicines, and then it funnels down to the one that we're gonna take to the FDA, and then they run it through their hoops to get an approved medicine. And then it doesn't stop there, hopefully, right? We want better and better and better treatments with what? Fewer side effects, easier to take, better uh, results for you. But we want to get there for now. And this is the part I need to focus on. Unfortunately, in the rare disease space, we need thousands of people to get to that stage. You can't run a very small clinical trial and then have it work and say, ta-da, now we're gonna go to the FDA. Why? Do you think that's unfair? Any ideas why we can't do it that way and just show that it works? Okay, well, one reason is because most diseases have what's called heterogeneity. It's different in your uncle than it is in your brother. It's different in your child than it is in you right? Almost every disease has that variation. So there are guidelines that we have to figure out how many people do we need to make sure before we put something out in the public that it's safe and effective. So for rare disease, this is where I want us to get going, is figuring out how we can create a safe environment that everyone can, can volunteer for so we can get these numbers out because the FDA won't consider it and we have to do it twice. They don't usually consider one that's only had one study. They want a replication. Okay, so these are the guidelines for the Food and Drug Administration. How much time do I have? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well then, I'm gonna go really fast because this is the most important part. It isn't just we're making this up. The reason we got funded is because these are guidelines and we aren't doing them right now. It's fabulous what we're doing but if we don't follow the FDA guidelines, there won't be a treatment that gets approved. The three things we absolutely have to have is we absolutely need an understanding of observational naturalistry of the disease. We don't have it. It hasn't been replicated. We don't know the subtypes. We don't know what one to six versus seven to 34. We don't know what happens when somebody is younger and is worse versus older and is worse. We don't know anything. We also don't know how to tell if a treatment's working. Number two is they, you have to have your outcome es estimates. You have to say, this is the measure. And everybody's gonna say this measure works. Third thing is, you have to show you have the participants. And it's not as easy as, we have a registry, I'm sorry, 
Dr. Gunter, it's not, because you can have a registry of 10,000 people and they don't care because you need to show those 10,000 people will come and volunteer. The number one reason drugs don't get approved is people don't volunteer. You might sign up to say, I want to help, but coming out and showing up is really hard. And I'm not going to say it's easy. It's hard. But we have to show up. So now, I agree, let's do our registries. We, we need the registry. But then we need to show up. And right now, we aren't ready. So I went through all of these with detail. I'll be happy to make these slides available. There's reasons that we don't quite meet these yet, many different reasons. But right now, in my other rare disease talks, I go, check, check question mark, or I go, question mark, check, check, or I go, you get it? We don't have them checked yet, so let's do it. We can do it. These resources you're talking about, listen to this, you know, Chan Zuckerberg, let's go for it. Let's get some, let's milk some more of their money. We can do this as a partnership. Okay, so we do need to observe. We do need to keep this going. The kind of research that all of us are doing is a, the exact kind of research we do. So you say, how in the world are we going to get thousands? How in the world are we going to get enough people? How in the world am I going to do the study that we wrote for the NIH, right? It may, may have been a failure before it got, out of the, got, out, got off. These are the main reasons. We have to work together. You've heard these, all these sayings about you're stronger together. Well, unfortunately for rare disease, we kind of don't have a choice. You don't have to like each other, but you gotta work together, period. That's all there's to it. So all the other rare diseases, this is what they're doing. That's why we're at the ULF, because we are gonna figure out a way to join together and get masses of people out. The first Huntington's disease meeting had 10 people. That's the study that now has 50,000 worldwide people begging to get into a clinical trial. And they've, they're now starting to approve treatments. We can't have these, these separate studies that go, I, I, I did this, and I did this, and I did this. We have to do, this is an old-fashioned research model. An old-fashioned research model is, I won the Nobel Prize for physics, because they didn't work on a shared purpose. They all did their own thing, and it's cool because lots of cool things have happened this way. But for what we're looking for, you have to work together. So these are, Curcatacil is the best example we have, but these are other examples of the village we have that's going to pull us together and going to help us do everything we need so when we go to the FDA, they're going to go, well, welcome go right through, right? Okay, so my bottom line. It takes a village. I need your help. I need your help to get people to come in. It's hard. You're already dealing with having a disease. You're dealing with a genetic disease. So you're worried about your, your mom, your aunt, your kids, yourself. I get it. But we got to brainstorm. These are the people this grant pulled together. And these are just the primary investigators. So what I mean, these are the doctors involved. There's multiple other people involved. And they're all working tirelessly to make a difference for Catacil. So what I'm asking you is what is your purpose? Can you share our purpose with us? And there's lots of ways to do it. And Dr. Gunter pointed out some of these. Do whatever you can. Maybe all you can do right now is, is talk about the importance of rare diseases. Maybe you can just help fundraise. Maybe you can go to a hoopathon or, or ride your bike. or That's all good. But if you can participate in research, if you can spread the word to those family members who you haven't talked to in 20 years, that'd be way cool. Literally, I've gone to family reunions. They don't want to talk about this at your family reunion or Christmas, right? But we can be the hard part. We can do that. We can do this for the people who are scared to go out of their shell. It's scary. This is it. Step outside of your comfort zone. It's going to take that. It just is. You're going to look at your bravery and it's going to multiply your energy because we need you to. And I know you can. I've worked with you before, and I see your faces now, and we aren't going to have trouble with this. But we can't do it alone. Okay? So reach out. Holler at me with ideas. You're going to have the solutions, so let us know. These are contact information for our study. First, I would like to thank... Uh, 
Bird and Chain and the Cure Carter Seal Foundation for inviting me. This is really very, very exciting to me, for me to be here and to hear all these uh, exciting studies and research. And so before I start, uh, although I'm a medically trained um, physician from Germany, as you can probably hear from my accent, um, at the NIH I work as a physician scientist. So I'm a bench scientist standing at a bench. And however, I work with clinicians who make sure that what we do with our patients is okay. So I work at the NIH, and probably most of you have heard after COVID and Fauci, where the NIH is, it's uh, actually a little village. In Bethesda, we have our own police, we have our own, own fire department, we have a lot of things like a little scientific village there. And the NIH campus is part of the overall NIH age institution that funds almost all biomedical research in the United States. However, the NIH campus in Bethesda is, is, is different from, from the funding on the outside, as it basically re represents all the different areas that are done, oh, that are done um, outside in a very small, area. So it's basically a microcosmos of all the different diseases that are funded uh, in the uh, in United States. So besides the, the NIH campus in Bethesda, there are other campuses in North Carolina, but also in Massachusetts and, and Montana. So there are about, as I said, 27 different institutes from mental health, neuro, neurological disorder, cancer, heart, lung, and blood in, uh, uh, diseases. And they do a lot of research, uh, basic research, what, what was outlined by, by Stevens. Um, but then the main part of the NIH is almost called the crown jewel is the NIH Clinical Center. So this is the, the largest research hospital in the world and there we uh, run only clinical trials. So for patients to come to the NIH, they need to be part of a, of a clinical trial. So we don't look after patients who have a stroke or heart infarction, only re relatively very defined rare diseases are part of the NIH clinical center uh, program. So I wanted to show you a, a small video, but uh, I think Jane and Stephen already described what the importance is on rare diseases. But if you have a chance, there is a series about the NIH on the Discovery Channel. It's called First in Human. Please have a look, it's, it's quite impressive. It's not about Cardacil, but there are other diseases very similar to Cardacil that are described here, how we move from, in general, how we move from discovery to understanding the disease to, to treatment. Oops, no, I don't want to show it. Okay, so this is our program. So we are much smaller than Chain's a large 500 patient study. And uh, we are basically between what Stephen described on the basic research and Shane described on the clinical research. So we do patient-specific uh, research to understand um, uh, different diseases. So at the center, as you know, it's, it's the patients and without you, we would not be able to do our research. And when you come to the NIH as patients, so the first thing what we do is, a head-to-toe clinical evaluation. And you saw chain schedule that goes in one day, so we can't do that. So we are not as highly organized as chain. So, for, so when you come to the NIH, it goes probably from three to five, sometimes even more than a week of, of, of time that you spend at the NIH Clinical Center to go through all these different kinds of evaluations. So, but beside that, so I have a clinical team that does all these evaluations and I will talk more about that. But I have also a, a basic team, a bench scientist that works on the genetics. 
So from all the patients that we come, come, are coming in, we do genetic evaluation, we look for how other changes beside the Nord 3 mutation that you know causes Cardacil modify these diseases. And then, as Stephen described, we also try to understand the disease and we do what is called an in vitro disease modeling or a disease in a dish, where we get blood samples from the patients or a skin biopsy and then make stem cells out of it, which you can see on the side. And Stephen talked about that already. So these cells that we are studying are having exactly the same mutation as you have. They are actually coming from you. And then we change them into endothelial cells or blood vessel cells or inflammatory cells and study them. We study them as very simple single cell parts, but also as more complex where we put different cell types that represent blood vessels together. And we also actually create little organs in, in these dishes called uh, organoids. So these are structures that are coming from the patients that have uh, bona fide blood vessels. And there was a question from Joe, I think, if they can blood, if they're actually connected to the vasculature. So there are two parts. We can use that for in vitro studying, meaning only in a dish, but we can also use these organoids and actually put them into an animal model. And we use mice for that. So these are immune compromised mice. They don't have an immune system and this allow us to study uh, a vascular structure from a cardacil patient in a living animal. So blood flows through and actually we could treat the animal to actually see what is happening in the patients. However, this is, we are close to it and we do it for control, but we haven't actually started doing that in cardacil patients. So, I'm at the NIH. For insiders who know the NIH, you can do a lot of different things. So if you're a researcher at the NIH, it's almost like you are going into a candy store. So we don't have to apply for grants. So we got our money directly from you. So it's real tax, tax money goes to Congress and Congress gives money uh, to us. And then we can do all different kinds of research and what we are doing is we work on, on vascular, on patients with vascular diseases. So these are not only Cardacil, as you can see as well. These are other very, very rare diseases. Some of them only have eight patients in the United States, like ACDC, or DADA2 has a couple of hundred patients. And they all are different, but they are all similar to that they have changes, major changes, this patient has major changes in blood vessels. So what we are trying to do is to understand different patients who have different problems, to understand how they are similar and how are they different. For example, Cardacil, you have uh, people with Cardacil develop strokes when they are in their 40s, in their 50s, but we work also with patients who have DADA too. For example, who have, these are children when they are three years old, who have one stroke after each other. So how, what, and both of these have major changes in the blood vessel. So how are these different diseases similar and how are they different? So I would just talk a little bit about Cardacil. As you know, it's a small vessel disease, so it does not affect the large vessel the large vessel of the, of the body, like the aorta or the vessels that go down in the, in, in, into the legs. And it starts relatively late. I mean, people are in their prime with 30 or 40 years old. As you know, it starts often with migraine, then stroke develops. Sometimes it goes into memory loss and, and dementia. And as we know, unfortunately, there is no treatment available for that disease. So actually, uh, Cardacil, although it doesn't, did not have a name, was first described in 1955 as a hereditary Biswanger disease. That's a disease that's now associated with hypertension, with a form of high blood pressure. And actually, the work of uh, 
neurologist Germain Boussier in France who had the first Cadacil family, for that extensive family, in 1976. And then actually the breakthrough, so to say, when they identified Cadacil was, an, again, a French group who worked together with uh, Boussier, was uh, Tournier Lasser and Anne Chotel, who then actually identified the mutation in uh, not three. So it's becoming very sciencey now. So um, as you know from, from uh, I think Jane, you talked about that it's a very complicated uh, mutation and protein uh, that uh, leads to, to Cardacil. So Cardacil, the NOT3, the mutation that patients with Cardacil have, is predominantly expressed in something that makes the vessel wall of blood vessel, which are the smooth muscle cell, which you can see over here. However, the, this is not only a protein that says something like a receptor or something that, that signals something into the cell. This uh, protein notch needs to have in order to function with another cell type, which are the endothelial cells. This is the inner part of the blood vessels in order to have a functional unit. And in Cardacil, this part is disrupted. So it's the communication between two different cell types. So it doesn't help us in only to stimulate one cell type. We need to make the cells to talk to each other again in a proper way. And what if this is not the case, what can happen, you can see here on, 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 on this side. So on, on, on the left, you have here a normal blood vessel. So these are the endothelial cells. And this one are the smooth muscle cells. And they communicate like this with not three. And if you don't have this communication, they don't know to behave properly. And then you can get things like, like this barrier between these two cells are changing and bad things happened, like you see that in Cadassol. Oops, that was wrong. So um, I want to briefly talk to you about a study that we already completed. That was a small pilot study in Cadacil at the, at the NIH Clinical Center, where we started in 2016, which was actually the first prospective study, research study, clinical study on Cadacil in the United States, which is um, kind of not remarkable, but it's a problem. Why does it take so long for the for United States to fund, actually to provide funding for uh, Cardassia? But now, after that, there are now studies from Chain and other investigators who, who, who increase the possibility to find cures and to understand uh, Cardassia. So this was, and I'll show you some findings on this study, it was a study at the NIH, and very similar to CHAIN, when you uh, enroll in this kind of studies, um, everything is free. Not really free, because you actually paid it already with your tax money. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, anybody who is invited in a clinic study to, at the NIH, uh, all the travel to, to the NIH and all the clinical investigation and all the stuff that we do here, the seven days of looking at anything from the toe to the, from the toes to the head is uh, included in that. So we had only 20 patients enrolled and it was absolutely no problem. It was fantastic how many people from the Cardassial community participate at, actually in our study. We had more, way more patients than we could enroll. And it was over three years, uh, two years, and uh, three visits. And we did very similar things that Jane and Stephen already explained, so I don't go into details. We collect blood work to do all the biomarkers. We use very similar biomarker scans as Stephen is doing. And we do then the skin biopsy to make the stem cells. And then we do brain imaging, very similar, and we talk about it. We share different protocols in clinical study, like Jane is doing in her study. 
and we also look at the eye because this is findings from Joe who actually looked in the mouse and then found out there's something wrong in the Cardassian mouse and humans are very similar in that case so they also have something changes in, in, in their eyes. And we do a lot of neuropsychometric testing in order to use that as a biomarker to, or as a clinical marker to correlate with other findings like MRI findings or things like that. And for us, because we are a vascular team, we look also at blood vessels, small blood vessels, not only in the brain, because you know Cardassil is an inherited disease. So any cell in your body has the same mutation. So why does it affect only the brain and not other vascular structure? We actually don't know, but we are studying it by using vascular functional studies. So this is the distribution of our patients, male, female. Uh, so we had uh, 14 patients with stroke, cognitive impairment, migration, uh, migraines and psychiatric disorders. And we, one of the main characteristic things of Cardassil are these white matter hyperintensities. And actually until now, we don't know what this actually means. So what we are trying to do is to measure it precisely with an automatic system that you can see here that was developed by Dr. Reich who works on, on multiple sclerosis to quantify it if, if the overall volume changes, but also where it is. Because the problem with the brain, it's not only how much you have, how much changes you have, it's also where the changes are. Some changes have traumatic impact on you, some changes do not. And so this shows some studies we then did in the eye. So we put a, a dye in the eye that usually should stay in the blood vessels, as you could see over here. So that's the inner part of the eye and has also the advantage, if you look at the eye, that you can actually see the blood vessel. In the brain, you, it's very difficult. You can indirectly see them, but you cannot look with your eyes. Seeing is believing. You can look not with your eyes how these blood vessels look like. What you can see here, that in an in a increased number of Cardassil patients, these cells are leaking. So the, the dye is going out and it does not stay anymore in the blood vessel. Why is that? Because the part of the vessel that provides this integrity is disturbed by the mutation uh, that is mediated between the inner part of the blood vessel and the blood vessel wall. So in Cardassil, patients lose these, these cover, basically, and the dye goes out. But also liquid can go out, which maybe is explaining why you see these white metal changes, which is from an MRI perspective, that's the way to look at it, is that you have additional water going into the brain. Martin, yeah? Um, about the retina finding, is that only, uh, is that seen in asymptomatic in people without any cardiac symptoms or only after they have like a stroke? No, this was seen in Cardassil. So the question is, is this specific of patients who already have advanced Cardassil or is, can you see that in, in patients who do not have advanced Cardassil? So first of all, our 20 patients, we enroll patients that were only five years after the diagnosis. So these are patients in general with low progression of the disease. So we, you can see that also in patients who are clinically asymptomatic. But I have to say that these changes that you see in the eye, you can also see in other patient populations. And in some cases we also saw it, but much more at much lower frequency in asymptomatic control patients. So we need to bump up the numbers to really see a clear correlation between the eye finding and Cardassia. But the idea why we do that is we want to see what kind of marker can we use when we give a treatment that we are confident that the treatment really works and change something. So another, another uh, study was we looked at blood vessels and this basically measures 
the elasticity of the blood vessels in, in a patient's body. And as I told before, I'll try to, to explain to you how the blood vessel is working. So you have the inner layer and the outer layer. The outer layer of the blood vessels is the smooth muscle cell. They are affected in cardacil. And uh, you would think that somebody with cardacil has maybe a change in that blood vessel wall and the blood vessel is not anymore responding in the same way as it would be in a, in, in a, in a controlled um, person. So this, this pulse wave velocity basically measures when the heart contracts, it pushes out the blood. So you can measure your pulse over there and then this pulse travels through the body to your legs. And depending on how good, how elastic the blood vessel is, there's a certain speed that that goes through. And what we found that in, in Cardacil, or, or in normal patients, when you grow older, you get a little bit stiffer in your, in your, in your joints and when you try to get out, for, at least for me. But it also means that the blood vessels are getting stiffer. And you can see here that over age, this uh, stiffness is increasing. However, in Cardacil, these stays uh, the same. Which is maybe, you may say, huh, that's, um, my blood vessels are like a, a young person's blood vessel, but it's not like that. It's that you lose the coverage of these blood vessels that make these blood vessels elastic. So this shows some data on neuropsych uh, testing. So we have a battery of 20 or 30 different uh, studies that we do. And in this case, we compare it actually with mild forms of Alzheimer. So to see how are Cardacil patients similar and where are Cardacil patients different from Alzheimer patients. And what we found is that in regards to memory, verbal learning memory, visual learning memory, Cardacil patients do better than patients with Alzheimer diseases. However, for psychomotoric function, Cardacil patients do worse. We are trying now to test that in a larger study in order to support this data and then maybe use that as a clinical endpoint. Yeah, it's for example how you can rotate, for example, the hand, but I refer to Jane, who's actually an expert psychologist who maybe can explain what are the different psychomotoric tests? Put me on the spot. Yeah, so yes, we measure it more torically, as Dr. Boehm showed you. We do that a lot, just finger tapping, how fast can you do that? But we also combine it with the way you're thinking, because when you want to look at speed, you don't want to just look at motor speed, you want to look at thinking speed. So if you ever connected the dots, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we see how fast you can do that. And then we throw a wrench in it and we say, okay, you're going to connect the dots, but now they're going to be in Roman numerals and they're going to vary with the alphabet. So it has to go one in Roman numeral with A in the alphabet, then two with B, and then three with C, and so on and so on. So we measure how fast that the thinking and motor speed can work. And we have lots of tests like that. that I think Dr. Brom uses all the same tests I use, so he could have explained it fine. <laughs> but as I said, I'm a vascular person, and I don't know too much about it. Neuropsych test. Yeah, over there. Mm. Um, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but when you, um, do you find that it's the reach through in um, small vessels diseases in general, or is it just for Cardacil diseases that you add there? Uh, the difference between memory and, and uh, uh, motor function? I, right? Yeah, I'm just saying, are these results similar in the public small vessel diseases? I do not know. So the study we did, particularly because the investigator who was running that, Dr. Snow, 
uh, was also studying Alzheimer, and that's how he compared it. But we could, would be interesting to see how are other small vessel diseases of the brain, uh, how other diseases of the brain uh, would have uh, similar or different outcomes. I think there is something specific to Cardassil because we work a lot with other, not necessarily neurological uh, brain diseases, but some of them do. And we don't see this um, way of coordinating uh, motor function. Like, for example, when many of our Cardassil patients describe that they have problems of, with, I think it's called gait, Gait, so balancing, but just by normal, mo normal walking, and has, has probably something to do with how the muscle are sensing the positions and how this is then signal back to the brain. And it seems to me that's something very specific for, or not very specific, but it's something that we also see in in cardiac patients. I did not answer your f yeah. questions because I don't know, but no. that's as much as I could say. So, in summary of this pilot study that's completed, uh, we see wide map. So, this is a pilot. So, we use that then to develop a, a bigger study. So, we use that to quantify white matter changes. And as we know, we, we know the volume, but we also need to know where these changes are. We identify vascular leakage. So, now we look in a larger patient population. We saw vascular stiffness or certain other vascular beds who are involved and are developing new vascular functional studies and uh, the neuropsych testing that we just talked about. So this is, uh, this is our new study that was initiated right after COVID started. So it took us two years actually to get the first patients in. But we learned that in order to study Cardassil, you cannot only do 20 patients, you need to do 500, but we cannot do 500 at the NIH. So we do a little bit less, we do 100, and we work with other centers, change centers. We work with Fanny in, in New York, we work in Australia, with people in Australia or in, also in, in, in Portugal. It's uh, 100 patients and 40 controls. Many cases, these are spouses or just other controls that we use. And we knew that three years that we follow up our cardiac patients is not enough time in order to study. So now we have a nine year follow up in that study. So these are several visits every three years coming to the NIH for more than one day, but less than a week uh, to, to participate in our study. And we do very similar study as in our pilot. However, we learned that, for example, it makes no sense to look with, a, with an image modality at a large blood vessel in, in the body. So cardiac patients are not different in that sense to, to other patients. So we already tailored for specific tests. We now added more tests to actually look at small vessel functional studies by looking at your fingertips to see the capillaries to see if there are changes in there. And of course, we do biomarker screening, very similar to what Stephen described with the somalogic with the 7,000. It's crazy how many things, data points you get. And we use this, the stem cell. So these are just the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And uh, by that, I would like to close and of course, we can only do these studies with our most important research participants, which are the Cardassil patients, right, with you. And as Jane said, you need a village to raise the child or to understand Cardassil, right? So we have a, a team of uh, really basic vascular researchers. This is Luisa Urela Rispe. She's a, she's a professor here at Northwestern. We have um, a geneticist, Beth Kosel. And then we have, because I'm not an MD, we have a huge team of physicians who all see you, work with you. And now you can understand why it takes more than a day, because you, you do some cardiovascular study with Dr. Broferio, or you do imaging study with Dr. Chen, and neurological study there. And it takes usually three to four days. By that, I would like to close, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.
it is my pleasure to be here. Now, we are going to do this a little bit different. Um, I used to do this thing with my oldest son that if he, he never wanted to go upstairs, I had to carry him. So I'll be like, okay, I'll do one flight of stairs and then you have to give me a kiss in the cheek. <laughs> <laughs> and then all, we will make it. So I'm going to stop every five minutes and you guys have to ask a question. If not, I'm not going to keep on going, okay? <laughs> That's the kiss. Um, this is the title of, of my talk. And, and the way, I think you, you guys did a great job by organizing the, the order of the talks for the following reason. Uh, we, we heard about the great studies that uh, Manfred and uh, Jane and also Fanny are doing, and they involve patients participating in research. And um, the idea is that that is quite important for us to do our research. And what I'm going to tell you now is, well, what happens with like all that data? What happened with all that knowledge later on? Does it actually lead to potential therapies? And the answer to that is yes, it does. And I'm going to show you how right now. Because everything that you're going to see next comes from studies in patients that told us exactly what to do, in which directions to, do our, uh, to follow up our research, and then how to develop new therapies and how to read those therapies. So this is what happens when patients participate in research and go and spend a day or a week doing all these tests. That's what we did. Uh, I'm originally from Colombia, and the patients from Colombia partic have participated in cadastral research for, for decades. And these are some of the results. So first, I want to tell you that uh, cadastral, we always think about it as a rare disease. But there are a lot of people that have a condition similar to cadastral. We call that cerebral small vessel disease. Believe it or not, it's the most common neurological disorder, not the most rare. It is the most common neurological disorder. It's called cerebral small vessel disease. And then a small percentage of that are people with cadastral that have a familial form. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because is it rare? Well, cadastral is, but it's a manifestation of something that is very common. Now, why do we study cadastral? For me, this is very personal. I studied because I just fell in love with these families. Back then, when I was in medical school in Colombia, everybody was working on Alzheimer's. And I was like, there are just too many people. <laughs> By the time I'm doing, you know, I graduate and I finish all my studies, they would have a treatment for that. So I told my mentor, give me something that nobody cares about. And he was like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, nobody's interested. T tell me. He was like, well, I have these families and I think they have Cadacil. And I was like, okay, who's working on that? Nobody. And I was like, okay, give it to me. Lost causes, sign me up. Uh, uh, so I started to work on Cassie because of these families, and then when I came to the United States to become a scientist, then I really started to interact with the Cassie families in the United States. And, you know, you guys have more things in common that you, you have uh, of differences. They, you know, it's a, it's a great community, and I, I've enjoyed working with you guys. Uh, so telling you about how patients teach us things. Let me tell you about this patient. So this was the case of a woman, Colombian woman, when I was in, in med school. I had the privilege of, of working with her. She was very young, 47-year-old uh, woman. Uh, she had had a stroke. The previous stroke was at age 24. That's very early. And this is her MRI. That's the imaging of the brain of a more, you know, like a normal individual. These are the hyperintensities that you guys are familiar with. That's abnormal. We, I did all the study of, of this family. Uh, as it turns out, we had like two very large families in Colombia. One, uh, you know, one this woman belonged to, and then another one very large who extended that pedigree. Uh, in these patients, 
you know, we are asking you to participate in research. What I think about CASIL patients is you guys are extremely generous because we first ask you to spend like hours on end doing all these tests, then we ask you for blood, and then we are like, we may also need the brain, right? It's, it's tremendous what we ask from patients, but it is true that all these, uh, all these samples are very important for us researchers. All the blood can, can tell us about what's happening in the brain. Then after passing, many of the patients and the relatives commit their to, to, for brain donations that then we use to do these studies and allow us to determine, for instance, what's wrong with the vessels. Those little circles up there, that's a vessel and it lights up white. That's the small mass cells and in a control, but you see in Cadacil, it doesn't light up. The small mass cells are gone. And that's kind of like the lining of the tube that allows this tube to, you know, carry the blood to the brain. But when, when you have Cadacil, that essentially doesn't work very well. Now, as you know, the, the uh, Cadacil is caused by mutations in, in, in NOSH3, and NOSH3 is actually expressed in this vessel. Like the gene makes a protein, and the protein is seen in the vessel. So it's a very strong correlation there. NOTCH3 is a receptor. It's very important for these cells to communicate with other cells. And Manfred was telling us about these cells, the small mass cells on one side, and then the endothelial cells, much more in contact with the blood in the lumen of the vessel. Now, there is something I want you to know about, um, about Cadacil and about NOTCH. NOTCH is a very important signaling mechanism, not just in Cadacil, but there are many other conditions. All of these are diseases of, of, of the cardiovascular system, like familiar tetralogy or fallow, allergy syndrome, pulmonary hypertension, arteriovenous malformations. They all involve the NOTCH pathway. We, we are familiar with NOSH3, where well, there is, I'm sure you figure it out, well, if there is a three, where is one, right? <laughs> About two, but there is also a NOSH4, right? So all of these receptors, it's a family of receptors, and they interact with some other proteins called the ligands, like Jagged and Delta 1, 2, 3. All of them are involved in the cardiovascular system. So that's important to, to keep in mind. And that tells us something. It tells us that notch signaling is very important for the vessels. Not just because Cadacid is telling us that, but because of these and many other conditions. Notch is also very important for um, other types of diseases like cancer. And notch one is very important for cancer, for instance. So this is a pathway that is very important. And that helps because that indicates that um, you know, there will be a lot of interest. Maybe one drug developed for allergy syndrome can help Cadacil. Maybe something that work for, works for Cadacil can help cancer. And pharmaceutical companies, investors, the NIH, they are very interested in this because it's op it optimizes resources, okay? That's the, like an schematic of the notch receptors. It looks like a stick, sticks out of the cell. It's like a, you know, a, you know, a radar, right? It's, it always sticks out, so you can actually capture the signal. That's what a receptor does. Does that make sense? Here is, I stop, and I'm not gonna continue <laughs> until I get a question. Anybody? And it could be about my work, or it could be about any of the or the work of the speakers. Yeah. Yes, it's exactly the same. That's a great analogy. Oh yeah, the, the question is if the, these receptors work like the serotonin receptors in the brain, that essentially they are serotonin receptors, meaning they detect this neurotransmitter called serotonin. And why is it important to have receptors? Because the cell, this blob that we call the cell, has an outside and an inside, right? So things need to be communicated from the outside to the inside, and that's what receptors do. Like in that case, serotonin, or in this case, 
um, the ligands that need to contact notch receptors to communicate a signal to the cell. Sometimes, I, I, and I can tell you what that, you know, if you are saying it's like, okay, what's the message, <laughs> right? It's a signal, tell me what the signal is. Through all my work, I think the message that the notch receptor really wants to tell the smooth muscle cell is please survive. That is the message. And cells need that, to hear that all the time. Otherwise, they don't necessarily survive. Like essentially, the message is, please stay. We need you here. Please do your muscle thing and stay. That is the message. And this is what I have learned. You know, I've been working on CASI 25 years. This is one thing I've learned. That's the message that uh, it wants to communicate. So when you have these mutations, you know, these infamous cysteine uh, mutations, that's just a type of amino acid, they, they affect the notch receptor. Um, and maybe that message does not get transmitted as it should. Uh, I have taken work in my lab that I call it always to be Keynes a patient inspired. I don't necessarily want to work on things that I start from like the Petri dish and then to the mouse and go to the humans. I don't like working that way. I like working the other way around. I learn from the patients. The patients tell me which way to go. Then I test that in the mice or any other animal models. And then I test that in petri dishes or all these very sophisticated models. And, and why do I do that? Well, because I'm a doctor. I like to talk to patients, but also because I think that approach may lead to better and more effective uh, therapies. Now, what did we learn or what did I learn from the Colombian patients? And this is true. We had a meeting just like this uh, back in Colombia, and we had we invited members of the family, like the two families, and they were kind of like sitting on one side, and then the members of the other family they were sitting on the other side. And during the, uh, you know, they were having breaks, they were talking to each other, and at some point a, a patient came in, and and she was like, you know. They have Cadacil. <laughs> she came to that conclusion. That was her, <laughs> you know, her analysis of everything. Yeah, they, they also, this other family, they also have Cadacil. But it's different. In their family, it starts a lot earlier. I can't believe that some of them got stroke at 18. That doesn't happen in my family. That was her observation just by gossiping. Okay. <laughs> and it was very accurate. We indeed validated that gossip and published it in a scientific journal. In one family, stroke started when they were much younger, in their 30s, and in her family, the one that made this observation, the, the, the stroke started much later, like 10 to 20 years much later. And as it turns out, they had different mutations, one with this C4552R and the other one was R1031. As you can see, they are really far away. Now, as it turns out, the mutation in the patients that started a lot earlier happened to be in the region of the receptor that was critical for interaction with the ligand. It was critical for the receptor to hear the signal. So that was very important for us because it told us, hey, it could be that the mutations affect signaling of the receptor, and when they affect it a lot more, the disease is more severe. That was a critical insight. We published uh, that ourselves in the journal Neurology back in 2002. The genotype, we call that genotype-phenotype correlation, is mutation, and kind of like what you see in the patient correlation. That was validated by the European groups later in 2009, and that insight really guided all my scientific career for like the next 10 years. I was like, okay, so it seems like signaling is very important, and when the calcium mutation affects signaling, that makes it more severe. 
that was great for me because I was like, okay, let's see if that's true. And here, again, comes from the patient and the family is gossiping at the Kassel conference. <laughs> then I go to the mice, okay? And I started to work on mice that don't have no tree. If they don't have no tree, I was able to study stroking these animals and sure enough, we found, for instance, that when the mouse doesn't have no tree, they get larger strokes. And all of this white thing here, that's the stroke and you see more white, that's bigger. So when the mouse doesn't have no tree, the strokes are bigger. When they have no tree, they are smaller. We're able to validate that in our animal models. Then we did all sorts of genetic tricks to validate that was true in cada cell. So we had the, you know, I made, <laughs> You know, you had the Cadacil families in Colombia, so I made here, but you know, I was here in the United States, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna make mice, and each mouse would represent the family. So we made a, a mouse for the families with early stroke, and then the, we made the mouse for the family with the late stroke. I'm still working with those, with those mice, and we give them to everybody that asks for them. So we made those mouse models, and we're able to replicate that finding of the correlation with the stroke. So let me show you, for instance, this is stroke size. And um, in the mice that had a mutation where uh, that was right in the region of the receptor that was important for signaling, the strokes were much bigger. So we were able to validate that. That came from the patients gossiping at the conference. We were able to validate that result in a mouse model. Now. Much later on, it was reported that as much as I can make mice that don't have no tree, we also have no tree, no cats in humans. There are a few people that just don't have no tree at all. So they are like my no tree, no cow mice. They're human no cats for no tree. And what we found is in, in, in these individuals, as you can see, they have, that's the, what we call homozygous nostril null mutation. Like look at the, the images here, the MRI. You see all, that, all those white matter abnormalities. The parents, to have a kid that is a knockout, each of the parents has to lack a copy of nostril, and then just by chance the kid might get it. And so the parents had like milder pathology and the kid had a stronger pathology and they also had strokes uh, in youth. So again, you see earlier onset, but then if you are the nostril knockout, you don't, you, you essentially get it in the youth. So that's very important. And again, we, we made even a more specialized mouse model that allows us to do something remarkable, which, which is have the mouse express nostril until they are adults, and then we make them knockout when they are adults. So we remove it in, adult, in adulthood. Remember, that was the important message. The message is, the message that Nosh 3 tells to the cells all the time is, please survive. What if they had been hearing that all along, and then all of a sudden, in adulthood, the message stops. What we found is that if we do that in a mouse model, and Nosh 3 doesn't work now in the adult, they stop hearing the message, the cells die. Those are the gaps that you see there in the arrows. That's where the small massa cells should be are there no longer, but they were there before. They just stopped hearing the message. Now, when, oh, wait a second. Okay, so, uh, Manfred, that, that's not a human. <laughs> that's in a mouse. We, we, we see the same lesions that you see in, in the retina. But what I wanted to get at is that now that we know, again, patients gossiping in the conference, we validate that in the animal model. So how do we come up with a treatment? The treatment in this case, well, what if we can make a drug that sends that signal to the smooth muscle cells and tells the cells to survive? And this is the method that we uh, develop was to develop an antibody. The antibody is what we call an agonist. An agonist antibody is one that essentially 
screams to the cells, please survive. And they do it, it's actually quite a neat trick. All the cast imitations are there, all of them. All of them are there, but you can actually tell Nosh 3 to send the message if you have the antibody binding in this region because it essentially makes the, antibody, the receptor break apart and just send, send the signal. So the drug works as a sh short circuit. You've seen in many movies, the radar is still broken, the receptor is broken, but they managed to short circuit so that it still sends the signal. So we did the same trick. The antibody binds down there. It will work for the vast majority of all the mutations because if you have been diagnosed, everybody says, oh, you have these mutations, it's an EGR repeat like two, three, four, 33, 35, it doesn't matter. They are all up there. Our antibody binds here. So it will work for most of them. We tested that in cells. We have a biomarker that we can detect on the blood that indicates that it works. That's where the work uh, of Steve and Dr. Farelani uh, is very important. You always need a blood biomarker. It seems like we have one. So again, that's where the biomarkers, every time they take blood, um, and, and our patients, uh, even in Colombia, when we ask them, is that, oh, can we have a blood sample? Well, I, I gave you one, like last year. <laughs> this is like, what time is it? It's like, well, I don't have it, I gave it to this other person. It's like, no, <laughs> it's, it's a bad joke, but it, it gives the idea. We keep needing like the blood samples every time because it tells us about the status of the disease or the treatment. In this case, how biomarkers work. It's very, you can see with this, with this graph. Essentially, this is the levels of, let's say, Nosh3 in the blood. It's actually that. And, and they are low, right? Then we give the antibody and the levels go up. That indicates the antibody engages the target. And that gets everybody, like investors, pharmaceutical companies, very excited because they are like, oh, this drug. I'm, not only it may work, I will know if it works. And that makes a huge difference for them. So this is a biomarker actually working. This is how, this is how they operate. Uh, we did that in cells. We, again, now we go back to the mice that have the calcium mutation and we give them the therapy. And we see that it can go into the brain of, of the animals. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Jane Paulson was telling us about like the blood brain barrier. <laughs> we have an advantage in cada cell. It's like the, the weakness becomes opportunity. The blood brain barrier is weak in cada cell. So things like antibodies that shouldn't go into the brain actually do go into the brain. But like a lot, talking about opportunity. So these dots are the antibody penetrating the brain. And I was like, you look, it works. It goes into the brain. Why? Because the blood bar brain barrier is weak. So that comes to an advantage. Um, and we were able to show that when we give the, 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 the antibody to uh, the animal, uh, let, me, let me see. And, and, and here is, again, where I stop. And I need a member from the audience to tell me what's different. So what's different between this vascular tree and this vascular tree, what's different? Please raise your hand and tell me. Or just scream, okay. Which one? This one, more structure. What do you mean by structure? More branching, right? It goes here all the way to there and then it branches and then all the way to, so those are smooth muscle cells what happens here? It's less branches. It's just really like the, the main trunk, right? Not the branches. So this one was treated with a control. This one was treated with the Nosh 3 agonist antibody that we tested on the mouse because we tested it in the cells because the patients were gossiping in the CASID conference. Now, uh, that's the quantification of that. Uh, and 
more quantification in this case of the biomarker, working not just in cell culture, but actually working in the, in the, in the blood of the animals. How do you guys think I found this antibody? You think I made it? You think somebody had it? Anybody remembers how I found it? No? Okay. You guys are late in the game. Okay, so here is, <laughs> maybe Barbara, this, this will uh, ring a bell because Barbara Hunt, she was our, um, uh, involved with the, with the organization back in the day. So what happened was many years ago, there was a Facebook group and they organized the first CASID conference in the United States at the Roadside Hotel in Columbus, Ohio. And they wanted to have a speaker and they invited me. I had just been promoted to faculty at Harvard and they wanted me to be the speaker and they said, well, would you come? And I said, sure. So now we took all turns. I was the one and only speaker and I ran them through six hours of everything from like the genetics, the clinical, my, what I was doing. And at some point, I told that group what I told you guys. I said, well, notch signaling is very important. It could be very important for the vasculature. It's also important for cancer. And that's great news because that means that there is a lot of interest and somebody somewhere may have a drug that was developed for cancer, but it may work for Cadacil and it's somewhere stuck in the freezer. And then I saw this woman that ran out through the door. I was like, well, after five hours, <laughs> I don't blame her. I don't blame her. She, she just couldn't take it anymore. And then she comes back with like a box of papers and she runs through the stage and she gives me a piece of paper. And she's like, you said that somebody may have a, a, a drug for Cadacil stuck in a freezer. Is this the one? that you think it could work. That was that anybody. Can you believe that? Look it up on YouTube because that was a, that's actually on YouTube when it happened and the whole story of that conference is on YouTube. So she found it on the truck of her car because she's so passionate about Cadacil research, her family had been affected, and she would just stroll the internet reading, thing, reading things that we never read, like patents. She found this antibody, brought it to, yeah? Correct. Correct. And I just said, you know, with, with scientists, we say things sometimes rhetorically. Oh, yeah, somebody somewhere. She knew about it, and it was on the trunk of her car, and, and look at it now. So it's remarkable what these conferences can do and what patients can do. Sometimes it's participating in research. Sometimes it's doing their own research or gossiping, whatever works. Uh, now, I'm going to skip through this because I want to, uh, you know, it's just a lot going on. I, I want to tell you about what, what we're doing now, the anybody, the anybody is, is uh, being developed. We set up a partnership with a, like, uh, a company and they, they gave us, uh, the NIH gave us funding for development of the antibody, so it keeps on going. Now, what is my hope? My hope is that we keep on working and that in two or three years from now, I call, hey, Manfred. <laughs> Hi, Jane Paulson. Hi, Fanny. <laughs> How's it going with those networks of patients over there? <laughs> because I may have something, and uh, are you guys ready or are you not? That is the hope. So this is how it goes full circle. I also call the guy in Colombia, right? You know? <laughs> Because we need all these people. We need, we need all these people ready. We need all these networks ready. We need all the information ready so that we can actually proceed. Now, let me tell you what else I have been doing. Uh, and, and, and I have some great news to share with the community. So I, I also been working on, uh, with Alzheimer's disease. And there are these 
Again, families in Colombia that I told you I didn't want to work with them back in the day. Everybody knows I was too busy with Cadacil. Uh, uh, they have a mutation that leads them to have Alzheimer's disease when they are in their 40s. So Alzheimer's usually affect people when they are in 70s or 80s, but because of this mutation, they get it in their 40s, and it's like unforgiven. If you have the mutation by age 44, they start losing memory. By age 49, they have dementia. By age 60, they, they are dead. No questions asked. Okay, so, and they have found in this very large family, about 1,200 people have the mutation, 1,200. And all of them, that's the history, until they found this one woman that made it all the way to her 70s, and she was fine. No cognitive impairment, no dementia, no death. She just liked to have a good life, was living independently, and she was into her 70s. So she had a mutation that predisposed her to get Alzheimer's, but we also found that she had a different mutation in another gene called APOE that protected her. And we published that amazing discovery in 2019. That was all over the news. It was front page news in the New York Times and every other. I had people that apparently I went to like grade school with and tracked me down to, to tell me about that. this story, former colleagues. It really rocked the world because it showed us it was possible for somebody to beat the odds. And uh, we published that in 2019. That was in Nature Medicine. It got a lot of attention. And then it really showed a lot of changes in the brain that were not what we expected for Alzheimer's. And we just we, 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 we said, OK, well, is this, a, is this one woman a one time off? Or are there more people? We actually found now recently a man, also with the mutation that predisposes predispose him to have Alzheimer's, but he had another mutation that protected him, and we published that like a month ago, also in Nature Medicine, and again, the news took the world by storm. But now, it really showed us that we had a system. It is possible for us to find people that are predisposed to have Alzheimer's, but don't get it because they have another mutation, they are protected. So here, I officially launch the Resistance to Cadacil Initiative. There might be people there, out there, that yes, they have the mutation in Nosh 3 that predispose them to develop Alzheimer's disease. But one individual may carry that mutation and may carry another one that protects them. And that would be amazing. We told the NIH about it. We wrote a grant and we got funding to go out there and find the people that, yes, may have a mutation that predisposes them to have Cadacil, but make me, may, maybe they made it all the way to their 60s, 70s, or 80s, and they never got a stroke. We're looking for them. We need them, because if we find a person like that, we might be able to develop additional, what we call a, a protected case inspired therapeutics. Uh, and with that, I end, and if I have time for, oh, well, now, now I pass it on to you, because I think it's the time for questions, right? Uh, but yeah, please. For the way I do it, oh, the question is, how many protected cases, uh, protected individuals do I need for this research? One. So this is a, this is a different way of doing genetics uh, because uh, the way we do it is, uh, what we, we are looking is for extreme protection. So for extreme protection. So we're looking for 20, 30 years. Or like, oh my God, you don't even have an MRI abnormality. You are 80. Actually, I, I, you know, back in the day, we found we found a patient just just like that. But 
I was in med, med school and we, we weren't thinking that way. We knew about this guy, he didn't want to participate in research and he ran a farm and eventually he agreed to see us and he was just actually running the farm. He was 76 and working the field. So again, we are look, why is it possible to do it just with one individual? It's because we're looking with extreme protection and yes, we look for more cases that may be protected, but that is unlikely to happen. So instead of doing that, what we do is a lot of studies of what we call molecular genetics. We essentially identify the gene candy and make a mouse model right away and do all sorts of um, stem cells like uh, you guys are doing, uh, Manfred at NIH. And then we test for the protection in the models as opposed to having to identify. Yes, so the, the issue is here that it is known that people have a lot of mutations. How do you know it is the one? Because one individual can have like hundreds of mutations of in other genes. Uh, well, I think it's, you know, <laughs> how can I say? Um, it, our approach is like a paradigm shift in genetics. The way geneticists looked at this is, okay, we only have one case that is protected. There are many candidate genes. We don't know which one it is, so let's do nothing. That's the approach, and that has been the approach. There is no p-value of a statistical significance, so let's just let it be. Our approach is different. We are like, well, how about we do this research at on risk, that we will waste time and resources, but maybe we find something spectacular. I can tell you, we published this in 2019. I didn't know if this was true. Oh really, can you say that? Yes, you can, I just did. But guess what I know now, we were right on this one. It is protective. It's protective in more people. It's protective in mice. It's protective on, who was talking about cerebral organoids? Steve, it's, it protects cerebral organoids. It's protective. So again, talking about doing things out, at risk of being wrong <laughs> and, and just going with it. I think uh, Alzheimer's definitely needs that type of thinking. When you are like, oh, we need to think outside the box. This is what thinking outside the box looks like, okay? <laughs> oh, for Kadasi, we need that type of thinking too. We need to think outside the, bo uh, the box, take risk, and we may, we may have a winner. The second case, well, we just published it a month ago, so I just kind of did the same. <laughs> you know, we got a candidate, we put it out there, we did a lot of research that increased our confidence. But I don't know if we're right. We might be, and I'll tell you in two or three years. But we need to do this type of studies because otherwise, uh, we, we're not going to move on. And uh, uh, Dr. Paulson was telling us earlier about Huntington's disease. A lot of trials going on, but Dr. Paulson, you may agree with this. That was the first gene that was discovered. Dr. Paulson, do we have a treatment? No. Okay, thank you. The first gene that was discovered for any neurological disorders for first Huntington. We yet don't have a treatment. So we really need to do things much faster, much better, and maybe the standard ways of thinking don't really help. Um, you never know who's listening, you know, but uh, maybe it's the baby over there and he's the one that is going to discover the treatment for Cadacil. He was really paying attention. <laughs> you know, you never know when you give these talks, you never know who's listening and who's going to do what. Maybe he already came up with the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Is 
Yeah, that's a really good idea. So the question is, if if for the for the per, the two one or two people that got protected because this other gene mutation, if we can then go out and make like drugs or use gene editing to to do that and then apply to other people, yes, that is the idea. So for the grant that got approved, the first aim is the following. Well. Could it be that this mutation that protects against Alzheimer's also protects against CADA cell? I mean, why not? It's protective, right? It's when you wear a water, waterproof jacket and then you spill yogurt on it. It's like, well, it's waterproof, right? <laughs> it also, I mean, it's not that the, oh, no, it's yogurt. I'm going to throw away the jacket. Well, it's waterproof. What are you talking about? So it is protective. So we do hope that that's the case. Uh, now, what are we doing? We actually, of all things, just because I have an expertise with antibody, we made an antibody against APOE, the, that thing, it, and, uh, to see if it does the same as a mutation, and it does. Why am I saying this? Because I, uh, gene therapy is out there, but I just feel like there is still a little bit of time before we can use it as treatment, but antibodies are better drugs that we can use right now. So it was just a practical consideration. But sure, if we had the technology and all the approvals to just put that mutation in people at risk of Alzheimer's, they are not gonna get it. Like, like I'm, I'm pretty, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure about that one now. No, it will be, so the question is if for gene therapy it will be for like people that at birth or it will be for uh, people that uh, already have the disease. I would say from an ethics perspective, the way things are established right now would be for people with established disease. I'm not an expert in ethics, so I'm not gonna go in, into the, the details about at birth gene editing, I think it's too controversial, but I don't even have a pos an informed position on that. So, open our questions to the audience, and also I think Pedro has been following the chat. I think we've seen a lot of good questions coming in on the chat. Um, so, go for it. You know, if you have questions for a specific individual, a speaker, that's great, or for the group as large, and we'll see who Answers. <laughs> I have two questions. And apologies in advance if these are not correct or appropriate. But um, Dr. Paulson, first of all, so I um, was diagnosed eight years ago. And about four years after that, I had a brief meeting with a genetic counselor who helped me understand that, um, that the genetic the results of the genetic test for diagnosis um, shows essentially the pattern, um, apologies if I'm not describing this properly, um, but the pattern or sequence of the gene. And so that my children, if they, if and when they go to test, can, uh, can use that uh, for a more precise, perhaps, uh, diagnosis. Um, as part of the um, Cadisil cons Consortium study, will there be an analysis of these genetic sequences um, so that intelligence can be found? Yeah, we're going to look at everything. And, and we're working with a fabulous geneticist who literally focuses on small vessel disease. So I'm really excited that we have her. She's in Texas, Miriam Fornage, and she does a lot of the genetics for most small vessel diseases. And so we're going to look at everything. We're not going to focus it. And they do that in many genetic diseases at the beginning. They try to focus on what does the family have. In fact, that's the way they did genetic testing when the gene isn't even found. Uh, they might look at a certain area and see if you have the same uh, in that area, then we called it a marker. And then we'd say, yes, you have the same marker as your parent. That doesn't mean for sure, but it means your probability is higher. But 
they do that, uh, but now we would just probably do the whole thing and let them know exactly what their genetic uh, change is. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Another quick question based on your presentation, Joe. Um, where you mentioned earlier in your presentation that um, within families there are some similarities um, and some may be less affected and some may be more dramatically affected um, by the mutation. Um, you know, as patients, as those who are diagnosed, diagnosed um, we read, or at least I've read, that um, a parent's pattern of, um, of experience with this disease, it may not necessarily be the same as uh, another family member or, or their children. Um, and so when I looked at the uh, statement you made about likeness within families, uh, that didn't compute for me because I hear you can't assume a pattern. In other words, I like to tell my kids um, who are worried about their futures and, you know, one who has children of his own. Um, who, and no, none of them have been tested yet, purposely. Um, oh, you know, I'm, I'm so functional, I say this, I'm so functional, I'm doing so well, you don't have to worry about your future. But one knows better and he says, but I don't think that's the case. What can you tell us about that, please? Uh, yeah, that is a really good question and I think it's important that we understand that there are two different like fields. One is population genetics and the other one is individual genetics. Okay, so when when let's say I tell you, oh, you know, um, there is a pattern for this particular family, and there is a pattern that is different from the pattern in this other family. Maybe I should have told you like these families were like one of them had 200 people, and the other one has like 900 people. So that was population genetics in a way. Uh, at some level, is average when all things considered, and we look at dozens of individuals there were patterns that were different between the two families. But it is true that when we look at individual genetics, then there is more variation, even within the family, and even within individuals with the same mutation. So I think what you, what, what you had explained and the way your family understood this is more accurate because you are looking at it from an individual genetics perspective, there is more variation. And, and this is again where we, uh, and why is that? Well, it could be because there are protective factors or there are other environmental factors that make it worse. It, things are different between, like even cada city has been shown, it's different for men and women. Do you, you know, do people smoke or they don't? You know, what is the, you know, th th there are many factors that could influence that. I don't know if anybody else from the panel. Yeah, so what you are describing is uh, that uh, there are different modifiers of a disease, genetic modifiers. So that uh, in one disease or in one family that has a clear mutation, but that the, um, the disease presentation is very different between the different family members. So this could be that the disease itself has a certain kind of penetrance that in some cases becomes more severe or not, or it could also be that there is a really defined genetic modifier and you identify a genetic modifier that causes uh, uh, to block Alzheimer. There are other genetic modifiers that make uh, patients immune against HIV infections. We had maybe heard about the Berliner patients. So these are all changes that can be identified, it can change the disease uh, progression within one family. And actually we are looking in our study for exactly these modifiers. And APOE is actually one of them that we are particularly interested in to, to see if APOE is changing the disease state in, diff in families of, uh, of with cutter cell. So I, I, have, I have a I question from the audience that um, I, I think is germane you know, to the idea of collaboration. So an audience member has asked me to ask that, you know, this is a person who has participated in, in multiple studies and 
feels uh, a little put out having to get MRI scans for each study. <laughs> so is it possible that there could be collaboration somehow between studies that would encourage participation in the studies whereby an MRI scan could be shared across the study so someone wouldn't have to go through the same procedure two or three times. And that you could generalize that to other things probably as well. But um, I'd be interested in the panel's comments on if there's ways we could improve collaboration between your studies to make participation more likely in the different studies. Well, I would almost pass it back to the two of you because this is to me the most important thing to do. We have to decrease the burden on the families. We absolutely need you to partner with us. And in my mind, it is it, it isn't responsible from our vantage point to have studies that are duplicative. And so yes, the onus becomes on us. Now Dr. Boehm and I had talked earlier, so we are already opening up to try to figure out how we can better uh, work. It's fabulous that you guys and Dr. Alahi had got the Chan Zuckerberg, but that is the one that we really need to work out better collaboration on because you're right. I don't think it sh the onus should go on the families. Right now they have to go to three different places and get three different protocols. Some of them are best in biomarker. Some of them are best in imaging. Some of them are best in the eye evaluation. Why don't, why don't we all work together and say, okay, we can have one group that's gonna look at catacyl imaging. You know, how are we gonna do that? And how are we gonna, are we gonna allow the cutting edge to change? And there are ways to do this. If we work together, then we can have one protocol we all use and then we write grants just like we got two more grants. That's five million extra dollars to look at new imaging techniques. Brand new, that haven't been validated, so it's not in our home protocol, but we're gonna add those. And then if they show that they're useful, we might put them in the protocol that we all use. But to launch off and start with different ones without data, it has to be data driven. Everything should be data driven. So I think the onus is on us to figure this out. The good news is, look at this. We have many studies going on. This is a good problem that we have. But now the, the onus has come back to us to say, okay, what can we do? Because we are asking people to do this multiple uh, times and it, it really doesn't make any sense to me. And I think it's the two things. It's the maturity of this group, it's young. Uh, the, but the second thing is good news. So much has happened so fast that, that we didn't even realize that we would all be doing similar things. We were all just trying to get the, the first, you know, the first thing happening. Um, and so, and that's why it was easier for all of us to collaborate with Dr. Boehm because he's been doing this for so long. We all knew we got to talk with you first, but the rest of us were just happy we got funding. <laughs> so, so thank you for pointing that out, but we can do it. Um, but I did want to comment the APOE, we have it. I'd love to share it with people who knew how we're getting it to. So if, I mean, to me, that's the essence. We all get APOE and then we share it with somebody who is a master who can look. And I would love to share all our phenotype genotype to look at that, that protective gene. Wouldn't that be awesome? So to me, we collect the data in the same manner and then we use these creative ideas like has been shared here to find the, you know, that secret answer. The other modifying genes that we're collecting in our study, I would encourage everyone to do, they, we can look at rate of progression, we can look at age of onset. We have modi found modifier genes in many other diseases for both of those. So, and you, you mentioned you're looking at modifying genes too. So in order to find a modifying gene, we have to measure what we're looking at. So I am asking every symptom I say, when did you get that symptom first? And I know it's driving you nuts because you'll say, oh, I have a headache. And I say, when? I don't know. I was a teenager. I was in college. But the reason I'm asking you the when of each symptom is I'm trying to look at age of onset modifiers in your genetics. So there's usually a reason for these crazy questions. So. I, I do want to add that uh, my boyfriend just joined the Catacyl Consortium study, and I loved that I was told by the coordinator, anytime you have an, a symptom, contact us. And, and, you, and so I'm like, 
yes, someone's going to keep track of this for me. So that, I felt like that was one of the benefits that I understood. I don't know if that this is how it will happen, but, yes, but, <laughs> but I'm like, oh, thank goodness. I have notes scattered everywhere, and, but now I have a place where they're going to go and they're going to be used. So yeah, I'll just uh, echo that and mention on behalf of the, the Vasque Brain study that we are definitely open to decreasing the burden on families. We haven't started doing MRIs yet. Um, really, to date, most patients have shared their most recent MRI, and, and that, that has been very uh, helpful to us. So I, I think if you've done an MRI at one site, it makes sense for us to share, especially if it's a recent one. Um, but we will be operational for our MRIs should you not have a recent one in the future. Can you, if, if we've done the MRI through the Catacel Consortium study, is that yet available to the, to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative? We put it in all of our informed consent. It, it, it's a, there's a down and an up. You're reading a consent that says, this data will be used for all, for all of the future for every researcher who's going to make a benefit to, to Catacel. That's in our consent form. It's not typically in consent forms. It's because I've done this before, and we know that something's going to be invented. Actually, it probably already has been invented, and I need to get the data over to Joe. But honestly, this kind of stuff happens all the time, where we're looking at a disease, and then somebody else finds something really cool, and you got, if I don't have your permission, I can't share data with anyone. So it's unlikely that any other consent form at this point says that. Now we can all start trying to change our consent forms, but that's the most important thing is when it says, can you give your data to someone else? We are going to be super careful with it. We have to be, because that would just ruin everyone's research, not for Catacil, but for every disease. If somebody leaks out information and hurts someone's life, it can happen. It can happen by accident, but we all are going to be as careful as possible and so our consent does say we can share so i can share right now because i'm enrolling in um the study that the uh Allahi team is doing i could say instead of sending my cd with my last brain scan to you perhaps i could say could you contact the Catacel consortium people which is the most recent I have, or many, you know, others have. I'd be happy to do that. And there will be reasons that we won't. Like, you know, Fanny may have something she really wants to look at that isn't in our, our scan. That's when we, we have to work together. That's on us. And I think we will. I think we have a great, uh, so far, we have just fabulous people that are going to try to make this better. <laughs> Other questions? I think if not, maybe. Oh. One more. Um, I just really want to make sure that before I leave here today, it sounds like there's three studies, right? You and you and you. And I want to make sure that we have. I'm trying to just speak up. <laughs> it has to go to the. Okay. I just want to make sure before we leave here today that we understand exactly where we need to go and who we need to talk to because what I really got from this is that like you need us <laughs> to do these studies and I'm in a like position of privilege where like, I have the time and I can do it and so it's really important to me. I've already reached out to Ruth um, so I'm just like waiting on an email back from her and then <laughs> oh, okay great yes. Yes, please. Um, but I just want to make sure that I can sign up for everything possible. So just the website I need or the email or whatever, I want to make sure that we all have that information. So, so you can go to Cure Catacel's website. And we do have a, a, a drop-down box to get to the studies. And so all three studies are listed there. And then how to connect into those three studies are on our website. And then... Um, the Fanny's Labs, they have their website. I think we have a link to their website, uh, and we have a link to the consortium website. And I'm, I'm almost positive we have a link to your site, but I have, to, I have to look because I didn't realize it's been eight years, so we might have to make sure that that's been updated. Yeah, so 
studies on the government, clinical trial government, that gov, and um, well, you could get information uh, from there, or you could also email me directly. Yeah. And uh, then I can link you to, to the people who, who are working with bringing patients in. Yeah, that would be great. That's what I want. Email addresses and website addresses and all that. So. So it's great that you know who to contact right now, and some folks are in the room where you can register for some of these studies, but the Cure Catalyst website will have future studies as well. So if you want to go one place, figure out all the studies, go to Cure Catalyst website. Obviously, you'll have to contact the individual institutions and people to register, but you can go to our website to find out. Thanks. Any other? There's at, at 5.30, between 5.30 and 6.30 before dinner, there's like an informal room where we can gather informally. Um, I, no, it's not this room, actually. It's, um, it's on the schedule, which I don't have in my hand. It's downstairs. Yeah, anyway. And so, yeah. <laughs> So um, yeah, so you can bring additional questions or um, or trade email addresses for contact and whatnot. So thank you very or, much. Or it's been, yeah. <laughs> the Zoom questions. Sorry. <laughs> you do you want to? No, you can go ahead. Okay. Question one, if I cho chose to participate in a consortium study and choose not to be informed about the results, could I later change my mind, no pun intended, and choose to receive the results? I ask because my mother's neuro neurologist told us not to test because it might prevent insurance coverage. Yes, that's part of the counseling is you, you really want to always go through counseling because what they'll do is they'll say one, two, three, do these things before you test because you might be in a big organization where it won't matter because they cover you in a group. If not, however, you, you, you have to be honest. So if they say, do you, are you aware you have any genetic conditions that will predispose you to a health condition? Even if no one knows but you, if you say no, they, you know, they may go after that. So you'd want to get the counseling first because the counseling will tell you one, two, three, do these things first. This counseling goes to no one, this, these gene tests, except when you request it. However, you can change your mind later so you don't have to pay for it. This way it's paid for. And there are what's called CLIA cert certified test findings so that at least it is a certified testing center that you can get when you select to do it. But even then, if you're ready to give the information to someone, make sure you go to a counselor and get all the things you need to do first because that's the thing is our laws are not good enough yet. There's simply not. And we need to protect one another to make sure we have all our ducks in a row before we allow that to go to anyone. And sometimes the, in our other studies, and this was thousands of people, the main reason it was released, unfortunately, it was just casual conversation with yourself and your your people. You just don't know. So just be as, as careful as you can. Uh, that's what I would recommend. I just thought that since the Affordable Care Act went into effect, that insurance companies couldn't deny us anymore for pre-existing conditions. Am I wrong in that? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's what the genetic counseling can, can help with. And I, I, I need to set up my appointment with, for my boyfriend um, for the consortium study. So I can't, I can't tell you exactly what is covered with the genetic counseling. But something we can definitely that's follow wild. up on. <clears throat> yeah. there, there are additional laws that may protect that. But I think that's yeah. the importance of going to a counselor and asking those questions directly from a professional. But there are other laws other than the Affordable Health Care Act that can help you. The, gene the GINA bill is the only far-reaching bill that's been put forth, the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, and it does not cover you. I mean, it helps a little bit, but it does not cover you. We also have a certificate of confidentiality, which you can get from any NIH-funded research, which means even if they come to me with a subpoena, 
I don't have to, I can't, I still don't have to give any information out because they've covered it. Right. So there are lots of protections you need to pay attention to. I don't want to make it spooky, but, you know, we want to be here to make it safe for you. So I, the Affordable Care Act, in my knowledge, does not protect you. For the purposes of the studies, it, that doesn't get shared with anyone outside. Nothing. Right. Yeah. So many microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know this was an athletic event, did you? <laughs> I would like to ask, here's another question from the chat. I would like to ask Dr. Joe, since he is an eye specialist, if Catacil can show up as a problem in the retina, a problem in the retina. In other words, it actually be clinical I, I think, problem. Uh, yeah, that is, a, that is a good question. I would say when uh, probably what they are asking is if it would be the first manifestation mm -hmm. of disease. I think it could happen, and there might be a couple of case reports about that. But if, if you wrote the case report about that, it's because it's very rare. So you get to write a paper. So <laughs> you, about it because it's so rare. Uh, I think it's mostly the, the the way we see the changes in the eye is that the person is already diagnosed with Caracil or has had a stroke or knows about the genetic status, and then we look in the eye, and then we see the changes. But it is very rare. Although it could, I think it has happened, and there are a couple of published reports about first manifestation as a retinal disease. Yeah. So keep the microphone a minute. <laughs> in regards to the antibody that Dr. Oh, Joe was... Where does it come? Because Manfred wanted to say something about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, you saw in our publication, in, our, in my presentation, there were some eye findings, but these were uh, incidental findings. So these were findings we see by a scan, but they did not have any eye clinical findings before. So as Joe said, it's probably a very rare uh, finding to have a primary... Uh, disease manifestation in the, eye, in the eye of a cardiac patient. So the next question in regards to the antibody that Dr. Joe is working with, is the next step to study it in humans or what are the next steps for the possible treatment option? Uh, the, um, this antibody is, was developed in a mouse model. So the first step, I mean, and it works really well. So. Now, it's not safe to take a mouse protein and put it in a human. Uh, it, will, it will generate like an allergic reaction of some sort. So what we do is a process that we call humanization. We make that mouse protein look more like a human protein so that it still has the good effects that we want, like rec recognizing NOSH3, but it doesn't have the ability to like generate like a immune reaction. So that's the funding that we got from the NIH was to go through the process of humanization. And uh, once the antibody is humanized, the, the thing is that when you humanize it, you, you change it, right? So you need to repeat a lot of the studies that show that it worked well. They have to be repeated. So that was like, okay, now it doesn't generate an immune reaction, but does it still work? So you test it all over, and, and then you can proceed with like, let's say additional, so additional studies that will lead you to like a human uh, trial. So that's, that's what we're doing right now. We're humanizing the antibody. Another question, could you expand on the status of ongoing development of A13? Oh, that is the antibody. So that, that A13, is, that's the name of the antibody. So that's, oh, okay. that's essentially what, what we're doing, is that we're doing the, the process of, of humanization and testing again. And all of that, the, the good thing is that the NIH has a good program. We managed to plug the antibody into this program. They can, if we keep plugged in into the program, they can take it all the way to, to a clinical trial. So they will pay for it. We just have to keep applying. We have to keep making progress, and then they they pay for like. Then we have to do studies of production or can cells make it. Then when they make it, it's safe still. And then 
okay, we're going to um, do toxicology. Is it toxic? And then uh, can we do a phase one clinical trial? So the, I would say the, the work is ongoing. It could go faster. The, the pandemic certainly didn't help. <laughs> during during the whole thing, um, but but we didn't we didn't stop. Uh, it just it just really uh, you know like everything else it slow things down, but it's ongoing. Yep. A quick quick question on the vasculature image showing the improved vasculature after treatment with A13. How does it compare to a wild type mouse vasculature? <laughs> These are tough ones. No, I would say that it was there was definitely an improvement. I wouldn't say it looked like a like a like a wild type necessarily. I would say there was a sub very substantial improvement, and that's what um, what therapies should aim for. Or otherwise, you know, whoever is telling you they have a miracle cure, uh, maybe that's not accurate. I would say no, it's not just like the wild type. I, I don't think any therapy does that. What we're looking for are drugs that are safe and, and improve, and lead to improvement. And I also wanted to, and, and I think I'm the, like the, <laughs> for this one thing, I'm the most qualified person to say, and I know a lot of people in the community and all of you guys. I really appreciate all the studies that are being done and how, um, you know, Dr. Relahi and Manfred and Jane, everything that you're doing is great. And I think you emphasize how there is no charge to the patients. And actually the, you know, the studies are done and they, you guys support that for the patients. And sometimes they even get small stipend to cover the lack of work. And why am I saying this? Because there are other studies out there that dress themselves at clinical trials and and, 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 but then you have to pay. So when, when patients ask me about those studies and they say, oh no, it's a clinical trial for like this new treatment and I have to pay $7,000. Tell them, if you are paying, that's not a clinical trial. That's not a, that's not a research study. So that's, again, I think I'm the most qualified because I'm not doing one. So <laughs> this is for the community. <laughs> This is, you know, because you have to keep yourself safe and tell what's what. It's great that we have two properly funded, ethically conducted studies available to our community. But guess what? There are more that are not so good. And you have to be able, as a community, to like, tell each other, you know, t t tell what's what. There so are even trials on clinicaltrials.gov that are as you described, because they don't screen. They don't you know, have a, a screening method for these trials that are registered. They just register them. And yeah, that, some, yeah. Some are, are scams. Yeah, but so, so we, need, we, need, we need practical things. They're asking me for money, and maybe it's not, maybe this is not a, maybe this is not a study, that, <laughs> a research study. They just, I don't know, want the money. Does that make sense? I think it's important to get that out. Sorry, I'm going to end with one, one final question from the chat. Where is the best place for us to keep updated on study progress or important information regarding breakthroughs moving forward? Jane, you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is part of what the funding that we're, Kira Kettisil is receiving from the CZI grant. Our portion of the grant is patient engagement, and it goes back to our mission of communication, advocacy, research and education. So we're really focusing, um, as I showed my, my diagram with the blocks of color, we really focused at bringing our organization from, it really was a kind of a kitchen table organization. We really brought it up to um, being to the standards of, I don't want to say standards, but I mean, because it was always a great organization. They've done wonderful things and, um, I, and I didn't list all of them, but um, we really brought ourselves into the space that, that, um, that Bert, you know, gave you the example of where we're being a patient-partnered organization. And so now we can focus more on what I wasn't able to focus on as president when I was, because I was just came off of being president, um, but still have a, have a passion for, is really getting the information out there. Because I do see um, information that's available to you that may not necessarily be helpful. I recently saw a post saying that NIH doesn't do any funding for Catasil. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you know, there is, yeah. So, um, but I feel that that's, that maybe we, we have a gap in our communication. So we're using that funding that we have from the CZI grant to get the information out there better by, we're updating our website. We're gonna be having um, a, a informational, say pamphlet that would be downloadable from our website that you can um, take to, family members or to maybe your physician that's not familiar with Catasil. And we also, are, um, so we have a patient advisory board, um, which one of our members is here. We've only had two meetings, but they're helping us uh, by giving input as to what they see is missing. But we want to hear from other people as well. You can email us at info at or Is it dot com? I don't, I don't email it, but I do read the emails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it is our, that is on our website as well. Um, but that's what I would say is that if you feel that you can't find a good place for finding the information, let us know what kind of information you're looking for because we want to be able to fill that gap. It's really a, a big role that we can play. Um, what we've done in the past is we ask students to take a scientific article that's important that you find this article and, and they make it into more understandable language. And so that's just a resource that you could think about because I don't, interpreting every paper that's important can be really overwhelming. But, you know, and we that might, that you that are publishing papers sometimes you know, we can find a student that's willing to do your paper and help you. So you make sure that you control the message that gets out there, but that it gets out there in a way people can understand. So that might be something to think about. There's a site called HD Buzz. They kind of stole the buzz from other stuff, but that does that exact thing for that community. Excellent. I, thank you. See, <laughs> I'd love to hear more ideas. Thank you. <laughs> 